Welcome everybody. How you doing? <clears throat> me, 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 me. Oh, you guys saw that, Anila? Did you see that? Now, these are classic t-shirts. They say that they're tight on the top and loose on the bottom. But I don't know if they're loose because they don't hide my love handles, which through your prayers, praying for me, that God give me self-discipline, self-control. I will melt them off, burn them off, and get tight. <clears throat> and may God destroy my vanity, my pride, and arrogance. <clears throat> but, guys, the young man has seven more questions for me. So <clears throat> here's what you can do for me. First of all, hit the like button. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Share this on your social media platforms. <clears throat> Let's invite more folks. Secondly, if you are distracted by conversing in the comment section, then guess what? You're not going to learn. <clears throat> His questions <clears throat> will help all of us. As the Holy Spirit, we pray, will fill me and fill all of us to go deep in Scripture and see the irrefutable evidence that the God of Scripture is triune and that Jesus is Jehovah in the flesh. So focus. And the most important thing, pray. Pray the Holy Spirit fills every one of us and he comes to the forefront. I'm his mouthpiece. We are his disciples. You are not my disciples. So glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, before we begin, let me just share some things because we're going to pray and we're going to call him. He's waiting. <clears throat> so pray for that. And Ryan, I saw your comment, sir. Number one, all glory to the Father, all glory to the Son, all glory to the Holy Spirit, the one true God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. May he flood us in his infinite love, compassion, mercy, and the blood of Jesus Christ and fill us with the Spirit. May the Holy Spirit empower us to walk worthy of Jesus and love Jesus and not be a hypocrite, never shame Jesus, but love Jesus Christ by our deeds and never fall into a scandal. That's my prayer and my trust in the Holy Spirit to save me, that I will finish the race and glorify Christ, and he will not give me what I deserve. We reached over 70,000. We're over 70,000 subscribers. Uh oh there goes my daughter. Hold on. Hi, Bobby. I'm live right now. My beautiful Baba. You are beautiful. I love you. We wanted you to, to watch us play hockey. So well, watch you do what? Play hockey. Okay, can I do that after I'm done with my live stream? Because uh, I'm live right maybe, now. Maybe because you have volleyball. Okay, and volleyball. Yeah, because I want to watch you girls. I miss you. We're live. Now, girl, guys, this is my baby girl. Pray for them. Pray for my daughters. Pray for their mother. Pray, my oldest daughter, birthday coming up, that Jesus, my Lord, will bless me to be with them and love them and spend time with them. All right? Who was screaming? Somebody screaming in the background? So pray. This is my baby girl. But I don't show them. So the Lord Jesus, protect them. The Lord, protect you guys. We can send you pictures. Yeah, but yeah, send me pictures. But yeah, now they're all praying. You know how many people are praying for you? You know how many subscribers I have on my YouTube channel? You got your... Ah, uh, Bobby. Because I wanted you to see my singing toes. Okay, now, you know how many subscribers I have on my channel now? 100,000. Almost. I'm over 70,000. Close to 100,000. So what are you going to do is you're going to pray. Say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for blessing Baba. 70,000. Yes, thank you, Lord Jesus. This is what I want you to do. You and your sister say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for blessing Baba's ministry. Help Baba to love you, Lord Jesus, and obey you. And bless us and bring us together. Okay, I have over 70,000 subscribers, yes. It's a dollar a subscriber? What? You have 70,000. Over 70,000. In Jesus' name, by the end of the year, we're going to have over 100,000. Are you praying? But, you're, but is it a dollar a subscriber? No, there's no. I wish it subscribed gave me a dollar, then I can buy you a mansion on earth. But we have mansions in heaven. But uh, can I call you later when I'm done? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. No. Hi, uh, Bobby. Bye. Listen, hold on. Wait, wait, before you go. 12 more days and your birthday comes. <laughs> Pray. 12 more days. Quack, quack, pick up. Quack, That's my oldest. You know, there's over 70,000 subscribers. They're praying for you and your Baba. In Jesus' name, guys, I'll be with them this year every day. Amen? Because I can't be without them. I love you, girls. I love you. Uh, Bobby, call me, huh? Okay, call me. Okay, girls? I love you. Please. I love you, girls. Bye. Bye. Guys, it's not easy, man. 
they're in another state being raised up by another man. And that's a knife in my heart. And I have to confess, my heart is crushed because there's someone else, another man in the house. God is the God of the miraculous and he hears your cries. Cry out for me. Lord Jesus, bring them to me. Remove this man. Please, Lord. It breaks my heart. And about 12 more days, my oldest daughter is going to be 13 and I won't be there. So, again, now it is not a coincidence. This happens when I'm live streaming, right? Why do you think that happens? Satan hates us, hates me, and will do anything to try to distract me. But the Holy Spirit, who's almighty over Satan and creation, he fills us, and he that is in us is greater than he is in the world. So pray for me. Now, with that said, let me let me share with you. Glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We're over 70,000. And what's funny is, one of the guys who's a regular, look what he said. Jvilibi, are you here? He said, dude hit 70K from his kitchen. Stuck for a law. Dude hit 70K from his kitchen. In this kitchen, not having a professional studio, not having state-of-the-art equipment, because God is almighty. He can take your two pennies and multiply them as a testimony. Our God is almighty. He can take mediocre <clears throat> internet connection and less than flattering background and do wonders for the glory of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, with this said, now let me, in honor of 70,000, I put on a video in honor of 70,000. Now, my baby girl, look what my baby girl did, Lampanto. My baby girl sent me this. Never going to give you up. Never going to let you down. You know the song? So she's reminding me she'll never give me up. In Jesus' name, Lord, bring them. Now, in honor of 70,000 subscribers, I did a video and I just posted it. Go to my YouTube channel on my shorts. In honor of 70,000 subscribers, I had my toes sing for you guys. Here it is. My singing toes. You ready? In honor of 70,000 subscribers. Take good care of her, baby. Be just as bad as you can be. And if you should discover that you don't really love her, just come over home to me. This is how I thank you. Shut up, man. Just as bad as this can be. And if you should discover that you don't really love her, just come over home to me. One more time. Oh, take good care of her, baby. Be just as bad as this can be. And if you should discover that you don't really love her, just come over. Oh, to me. Right, there you go. You know, I need serious spiritual healing. I need serious spiritual healing and professional help. When I sit on my couch and record me moving my deformed looking toes in order to get attention because I'm sick and I need healing. And may the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse all of us. You know I got serious issues. Now, with that said, we're going to pray and we're going to call this guy. But hold on. This uh, classic key ain't classic, mister. I don't like the classic key, mister. Supposedly tight on your top and loose on your bottom. Yeah, right. In Jesus' name, this year, we're going to get healthier and holier. And I'm going to lose more weight and keep it off. So I don't end up looking like Protestant believer. <laughs> All right. I'm going to wear this one. Okay, let's pray, guys. All right. You know, you guys got it. You, you, you know, guys, I am an example of 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 29. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 29, there you're going to see it says, God chooses the foolish things of the world. People whom the world looks down upon as foolish, as... <clears throat> What's the word I'm looking for? 
marginalized, oppressed, looked down upon as not being sophisticated or classy or intelligent. And he chooses them deliberately and empowers them to silence those who think they're sophisticated and classy, high class and wise. And I'm proof of it. Look at me. You don't get more foolish, right? Classless than me. Have Doesn't have any manners. Doesn't know how to be, behave himself, right? Politically incorrect. Now, by the way, here's how you know a woman is of God and she's sent by the Lord. If she And she's sent by the Lord to be your helpmeet. After seeing my deformed looking toes, after seeing my deformed looking toes, because if you notice, one of my pinky, actually both of my pinky, I was born deformed. Here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grow some of you out. Let's see if I'm flexible. All right, hold on. All right, hold on. Let me show you this. Let's see if we can do this. All right, let's see. Can you see this right here? This deformed looking toe right here? See this with a deformed looking toe? This toe right here, you can see my feet are deformed. This toe overlaps with this one. It sleeps on this one. You see it? See it, guys? Okay. Now, after looking at my deformed looking toe, if a sister can see that I have deformed looking toes and still think I'm attractive, you know that woman is a Proverbs 31 woman. Lean on me. All right. Now let's begin in prayer. You saw that, right? When you're not strong, and I'll be your friend, I'll help you carry on. And it's both feet, by the way. Amen. It's this one, too. Now, I'm more flexible with my left, and as I've been losing weight, may I keep it off in Jesus' name? I'm getting my flexibility. So let's see this one. Ah, I just smashed my toe. See, this one, I'm not as flexible. Shut up, man. See, right there? See? Both of my toes are deformed. Both. Now, after seeing those deformed toes, a sister can still find me attractive and godly. You know she's a Proverbs 31 woman. Shut up, buddy. Okay, Butch? All right? No, that's Bruno. I'm sorry, man. Bruno, I apologize. That's Butch. I get you confused because you got a nasty attitude like, like Butch. Okay, Bruno. All right, anyway, are we ready now? Let's begin in prayer so we can call this guy. Yeah, Adam Sheikha. Be prayed up, guys. We're going to go intense. He said he had seven questions. That means it's going to be a long marathon. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but the us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever, unto ages of ages, in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Holy Spirit, fill us, fill our loved ones, fill my daughters, fill this young brother, fill him with your wisdom to know the depth of Scripture and to empower him and all of us to then live out and obey the depth of Scripture, your voice, to be in love with your voice, transform, empowered, and Sealed by your voice in scripture to obey the Lord Jesus by obeying your voice and save us from shaming, dishonoring, blaspheming, or betraying Jesus Christ to never fall into any scandal, destroy our hypocrisy, remove the beams from our eyes, Holy Spirit, mortify our flesh to hate our flesh and love you and love what you love and be filled with your fruit, with your holiness, purity, righteousness, passion, love, compassion, mercy, patience. Filling us to worship the Lord, praise the Lord, sing to the Lord, pray to the Lord, obey the Lord, and to love one another by our deeds. Save us from Satan, to hate him and resist him, and overcome him by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you cleanse all of us. Cleanse this young man. Cleanse our loved ones. Cleanse my daughters in the blood of Jesus. Give all of us the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ for our healing, our medicine, our food, our nourishment, our salvation, redemption. And anoint my mouth to speak clearly without error and perfect the gifts you give me for ministry. Perfect recall of every jot and tittle. Destroy forgetfulness and not use the gifts for vanity or for self-glory. Crush our pride, our arrogance, our ego. Purge our motives to do it for the glory of Jesus and for the love of the church, your church. 
and to use it lawfully. Please, Holy Spirit, to never prostitute ourselves for fame, <clears throat> status, or money. Not to be afraid of not having enough. To trust in you in destroying our fears, our doubts, our unbelief. Strengthen my throat with the health and vigor I need to glorify Jesus Christ. And bless this man to understand. Bless all of us to understand. And use him as the light of Jesus to bring his family members to the feet of Jehovah Jesus. And destroy all distractions of Satan. Beatifies with the beauty of Jesus Christ. And again, Holy Spirit, I ask, strengthen my lungs, my chest, my heart, and arteries. Make my voice pleasing to the ears of your servants. Take over the session in our lives and own us and fill us completely. Own and fill our loved ones, my daughters, completely. Their mother, fill her and bring her to the feet of Jesus Christ. In true repentance and holiness and purity. And heal our hearts of any pain or anger or jealousy. To walk worthy of Jesus. To love him more. And give us the self-discipline, self-control, self-restraint we need. Please, Holy Spirit, be magnified in you with the Father and the Son. And bless this young man. <clears throat> and help me not to be a nuisance to my neighbors, but to be the light of Jesus Christ. That we shine with the beauty and holiness and love of Jesus. They will see Jesus in us and will never shame or dishonor Jesus. Give us the power to do that and to do it not for the praise of men. Please, Holy Spirit, purify our motives. Not care what people think. But care what Jesus thinks and never shame him. We love you, Holy Spirit. We love your, your eternal love and companion, the Lord Jesus, the Father's Son, who's in love with you and you're in love with him. And we, we love Abba, Father, from whom you proceed, who's in love with you and you're in love with him. And the Father in love with the Son and the Son in love with the Father. That's why the one true God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Bible is the perfect revelation of that triumph God. Have your way, Holy Spirit, for the glory of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father. And of the Son of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Now, I'm using Creator Studio, so there's a, like a only a five second delay. Now, before I call him, he's waiting in the background. A praise report. This brother told me I could share this. A praise report. I said I wouldn't mention his name. The brother sent me his pictures. He is a muscular behemoth. Now, if he's watching, if he wants to acknowledge it in the text, uh, he sent it to me on Facebook Messenger. A handsome muscular behemoth. He got baptized in the Orthodox Church as the Lord intervened and saved him out of Calvinism. You guys ready for this report? He just sent it to me. Now I said, can I share your testimony? He goes, yes. But I didn't ask him if I can mention him by name. If he's watching, he knows who he is. He sent me these beautiful pictures. He's coming out of the waters, baptismal waters, in the Orthodox Church. And as he comes out, he's a handsome, muscular behemoth. The guy's ready for Christian jihad. He's a spiritual and muscular behemoth. And you see a beautiful icon as he comes out of the waters. And here's his testimony. How the Lord, glory to the Lord Jesus, may he destroy my pride. May the Lord Jesus increase in me. And may I be a light to bring people to the ancient churches. Be it Orthodox, Catholic, Coptic, whatever it is. As long as it's ancient, glory to God. May the Lord use me to bring promise to the fullness of the truth. Right? Here it is. Quote, Brother Sam, I have a praise report for you. Watch this, brethren. Okay. About two years ago, watch this, how God uses us in spite of our sins and perfection. While watching your channel, I heard you ask a simple question to anti-ancient church Protestants. You said, what do you think came before the Reformation? Just that one question. You see how mighty the Spirit is? He'll just use that one Line, word, or statement, or question. This was a pivotal moment, movement as I was about to ask about the baptism process in my previous Calvinist church. Eat your heart out, Jamal Muhammad White, Antonia Fat Slop Dodgers. They're going to be upset with me, boy. Since then, I've been exploring orthodoxy and went through catechism. All glory to God, I was baptized and chrismated on Saturday. I want to thank you for asking questions that make people think. Now, look, taking a shot at Calvinism, and I love this guy. He's got a sense of humor. I want to thank you for asking questions that make people think. I guess it was predestined I wasn't to become a Calvinist and a laughing face. Yeah, if Calvinism is true, God has causally predestined all these conversions to these ancient traditions. Praying for your own journey and for you and your daughters always. And I know there is no Catholic here who will be upset with that because the Catholics still rejoice that the Orthodox Church is still a true church, right, that has more of the fullness 
than the Protestant denominations. So Catholics rejoice with me, right? So that's the beauty about being Catholic. You do believe the Orthodox Church and these churches are true churches, and they have more of the fullness, and they have an ancient pedigree, and you acknowledge them, and you love them, right? So rejoice. Was oh, that you? Did you just mention? Did he did he come out and clean and said it's him? Okay, I guess he's here. He said it. So you, I, so brother, if you're here, do you want me to give your name? It's up to you. If you want me to show the pictures, I think he's here. I think he mentioned. Okay, so he's here. Let me know, brother, if you want me to show pictures. Man, I didn't know you're huge. Yep, there it is. He is my mod Aaron. There he goes, guys. You see? Yes, it's fine. There he goes. That's him, Aaron, right there. My mod Aaron. And by the way, Aaron, are you mm -hmm. married or you're still single? That's him. Yep, that was him, Ortho Christos. So that was him. Ladies, you got a single brother who loves Jesus, and may he stay pure and all of us stay pure, and I practice what I preach in Jesus' name. But let me tell you what a hunk this dude is. Look at him. He's, there he goes. Look at this dude, man. The guy is one gorgeous hunk. Arnold Schwarzenegger, eat your heart out. Ow! Ladies, he's a godly man, and he doesn't want a Jezebel. He wants a godly woman who loves Jesus, who will walk this journey in knowing the Orthodox faith. The dude is a muscular behemoth. Look at that monster. Ow, 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 ow. Man, you fine. You fine. You make the rock look ugly, you damn sexy. All right, there you go. So now let's call this young man. No, hey, brother. God keep you pure, keep us all pure, and we never shame Jesus Christ and never fall into sexual impurity in the name of Jesus. May save me from myself. Brother, you're a handsome dude, man. Dude, I'm, I thank God you're a believer because if I saw you in a dark alley, I would think you're one of these jihadis and I'd be praying to the saints to ask the Lord to send the angels to protect me because there's no way I could knock you out, dude. I may think I'm the Assyrian Bruce Lee, but I'm not as fast or powerful as Bruce Lee to knock someone out like you. Unless I gouge your eyes out. So I'm going to have to do finger push-ups. So when I guide your eyes out, lights up, baby. Okay, now let's, let's call this guy. Let's call this guy. Man, dude. Do you have a sister that's as beautiful as you, but not as built? I mean, like skinny, you know, feminine. I mean, if she was as big as you, forget about it. Then she'd have to marry the rock, right? But do you have a sister that's godly, loves the Lord? That's in her 40s, right? Not as big as you, obviously. She's got to be, you know, fit. She can't be, man, I mean, because I can't be with a woman who's more muscular than me. I can't marry a woman who can carry me and deadlift me. It ain't happening, sir. That ain't happening. Eric Brown, love you, brother. All right, let's call this man. He should be listening, so I don't know. His name here is Faith. Hold on, guys. Let's call him. Ain't no way I'm marrying a woman that can bench press me. That's scary. Because if she gets angry and she not and she backhands me, I won't wake up for three days. <laughs>
my friend David Wood, you know him? Well, he used to yeah, be my yeah. friend. Now he's too he's too good for me. He's you know I I love the brother. I'm just kidding. I, I poke fun on him. The Lord will bring us back in his time. David Wood is proof that hideously ugly people can be saved. <laughs> so I'm proof that mentally challenged people who are traumatized and emotional psychological issues can be saved. And David Wood is proof that hideously ugly people can be saved because if ugliness was a sin, that man, even purgatory could not help him. He would have to. <laughs> anyway, but with that said, brother, John 14, 28. So he's going to tell you the father is greater than I, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now I'm going to give you examples where he's going to admit the word greater does not mean better in essence. So using the Joe Witness Bible, you're going to go to Matthew 11. Verse 11. Okay. So guys, the first objection, John 14, 28, classic anti-Trinitarian text that I've answered millions of times. The Father is greater than I. All right. So let's go to Matthew 11, 11. The same word for greater is used there. Can you read it for me as the Spirit enables us to recall Scripture and exegete it for the glory of Christ? Yes. It says, truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not been raised up anyone greater than John the Baptist. But a lesser person in the kingdom of the heavens is greater than he is. So you ask your dad, in one sense, is John greater than all the rest of the Old Testament saints? Mm. Is he greater than them in nature, in essence, in value, in dignity, and worth, or in position and status? Okay. So what would be the answer if I was asking you? Because you got to understand it too. I would say position and status. You have to, because unless you believe the other prophets were less human than John... Yeah. Right. So it can't mean he's better in nature because they all are human in nature. Right. Yes, sir. So they all possess human nature equally. But J Jesus still says John was greater than them. But then the one who's lesser in the kingdom is greater than John. So in the kingdom, there are people who will be greater than others. But in what way greater? In other words, in the kingdom, are you going to be more human than me, more <clears throat> sinless than me, more immortal than me? Oh. So you see the word greater doesn't always mean greater in nature. It can mean higher in status, position, and authority, right? Yes. So you establish that, right? Mm -hmm. You got to know how to answer because you got to understand. When you understand, then you can make it clear to him. So you get him to admit that. So, for example, you say, Dad, are you greater than me? Is your dad greater than you? What is he going to say? He's going to say no. Then you guys are both confused. So your dad's not. So your dad is not greater than you. So he cannot order you around. Oh, yeah, in, in that regard. You're yeah, killing right, me, yeah. sir. You're killing me, Smalls. In that regard, yeah. Is your boss greater than you? Yes. Why is your boss greater than you? Are you less human than him? No. But hold he's on. He's boss. greater than you. How can that be? He's my boss. He orders me around. So what? He, You're still human, and you're equally human as he is, so that means he can't be greater. See, that's the logic of your father. Yeah, your father's yeah. assuming if Jesus is God, then the father can't be greater than him. Well, if Jesus is God, but he became man and on earth took the status of a slave, then the father can be greater than him in status, but equal to him in nature. Because when mm -hmm. did Jesus say this? Uh, I think he said it before he was going to the father. Yes, he's on earth. Yeah. And on earth, what is the status he assumed? He assumed the, it's the Bible says that he took the form of a servant. Yep, slave. And this is in John 13. If you read 3 to 17, what did Jesus do? He got up and started washing the feet of the disciples, which is what servants do, right? Mm. And then let's look at other passages where our Lord specifically says, while on earth, he assumed the status of a servant, a slave to the Father, to serve the Father and serve us. Go to Luke twenty-two twenty-seven. 27. Luke twenty-two twenty-seven. 27. Luke See, guys, it's the same handful of objections. Once you learn them, that's it. That's all they have. It's the same objections. Okay. And he's got seven of them. So God, God willing, we're going to have a meat fest by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's going to be several hours. So let's glorify the Lord together. Now, in Luke 22, 27, Jesus on earth, what is his status? Read it. He says it. it says, so 27 says, for which one is greater, the one dining or the one serving? Is it not the one dining, but I am among you as the one servant. So the one who is dining is greater than the servant, right? Yes. But Jesus, I'm here as a servant. I'm serving you and you're dining. That means now in that sense, I made you greater than me. Mm -hmm. Right? Are yes. you seeing it? Yes, yes, yes. 
Okay, make sure you get it by the grace of the Holy Spirit, because once you understand it, the arguments are refutable because the Bible is a Trinitarian book. But now coming back to that issue again, now notice even in that example, the one who dines is greater than the one who serves. What does he mean greater? So the one who dines is more human than the servant? No. So the Bible shows and reality confirms the Bible because the Bible is ultimate truth. The revelation of God, who is reality, knows creation better than creation knows itself. Shows that the term greater can mean status position or can also mean in nature and essence. So you got to mm -hmm. determine in what sense is someone greater than another. Here, the one dining, the one dining is greater than the servant in position. But as far as their nature and dignity is concerned, they are equal in the sight of God, having the same worth and value, being fully human and both fully embodying the image of God. That's why in Galatians 3, 28, what does Paul say? There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither free nor slave, neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ. Mm, okay. That's Galatians 3, 20. Look at it so you can see. Day Jire, for you to try to explain that here, Father is greater in terms of <clears throat> being the source, which was interpretation of the fathers, you're going to lose this guy's dad, and you're going to reinforce him to become a devout Jehovah Witness. So help me to help you, Day, by not helping me. And just go watch my video and listen to my singing toes. Now, <clears throat> read the passage in Galatians 3.28. It says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in union with Christ Jesus. So when you're in Christ and baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit through water baptism, a slave has equal dignity, value, and is fully loved by Jesus just as much as the free man, right? Mm -hmm. You got it, right? Yeah, yeah. So then why is the Lord saying the master is greater than the servant? The one who dines is greater than the servant because he's talking about position. He's not talking about worth or nature, right? Yes, yeah. And so Jesus on earth, Luke 22, 27, is he here as king or as servant? And that specific passage, servant. Yeah, and throughout his earthly ministry, before he ascended to heaven, did he function as a king or as a servant? No, a servant. Okay, now let me give you other passages to show that. Go to Mark 10, 45. Mark 10, 45. 45 says, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom in exchange for many. So he came to be a minister, a servant, not to be served and ministered to while on earth, right? Uh -huh. Now go to Matthew 12, 17, 18. See what Jesus fulfills. Matthew 12. Now notice all the gospels say on earth he's a servant, right? Yeah. Matthew 12, 17, 18. It says, in order to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, who said, Look, my servant whom I chose, my beloved whom I have approved, I will put my spirit upon him, and what justice and what justice is, he will make clear to the nations. So Jesus on earth fulfilled Isaiah 42 1, which called him what? Servant. See, my servant. So he's the father's servant, right? Yeah. And so the master will be greater than the servant in position and authority, not in nature, right? Mm-hmm. So if Jesus is telling you, I fulfill the role of being the, fa the father's servant, then that means my father will be greater than me in authority because I am a servant subject to him, right? Yeah. But even with that said, a servant can still be as his master. So he can be greater than you in position, but you can still be equal to him in another way. And that's what Jesus said. Go to Matthew 10, 24 to 25. Matthew 10 what? Matthew 10, 24 to 25. It says, A student is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the student to become as his teacher. So you, a student can be as his teacher, mm -hmm. and a servant can be what? As his master. Reread that again. It is enough for the student to become as his teacher, and the slave as, as his master. So a slave can be subject to his master in authority, but still can attain a position that makes him one with his master, as mm -hmm. his master, right? Mm -hmm. So now that we've established the term greater does not necessarily mean someone who's superior to nature. Now, for example, I'm greater than my cat. 
Not am I greater than my cat is because I have authority over my cat, but in the eyes of God, I am more valuable and precious than now. He loves animals, but he loves humans more, which again shows you how amazing and mind-blowing God is that he would love human creatures who are the cause of such misery and pain and destruction, who even cause animals to suffer because of our selfishness. And yet he loves us more than the rest of his creation, which is mind-blowing, right? It is. But now let me show you where the Lord says you are more valuable than animals. Go to Matthew 10, 29 to 31. Uh, it says, two sparrows sell for a coin of small value. Do they not? Yet one of them will fall to the ground without your father. Yet not one of them will fall to the ground without your father's knowledge. What he's saying is that even God cares for sparrows and provides for them. And they will mm -hmm. not die before the appointed time. Because the Lord even controls the life of animals. Yeah. So if God is even concerned with sparrows. And he watches over them. And he sustains them. Sparrows. Now look at the point. He's arguing from the lesser to the greater. Yeah. Uh, 30 says, but even the hairs of your head are all numbered. So have no fear. You are worth more than many sparrows. So here the Lord says, humans are more valuable than sparrows in the eyes of God. He loves sparrows and he cares for sparrows and he commands that you take care of animals and not be cruel to them because God will punish you. But in value, humans are superior in value in nature, not just in rank. Yeah. You want me there? Yes, yes. Another example. Go to Matthew 6, 25. 34. Matthew 6, 25 to 34. So guys, I want you to learn this, that I'm better than my cat, not only in rank, but also in nature and value, even though God loves his animals. And he demands that I be kind to animals because he will punish me if I'm cruel to animals, even though I'm superior to them. He still will punish me. And I'll show you that from scripture, that God is concerned with animals. So go to Matthew 6, 25 to 34. All right. It says, on this account, I say to you, Stop being anxious about your lives as to what you will eat or what you will drink or about your bodies as to what you will wear. Does not life mean more than food and the body than clothing? Yeah, in other words, you don't just exist for pleasure, for food and clothing. You exist for something greater, to know God and enjoy God and be loved by God. That's his point, but go ahead. Observe intently the birds of heaven. They do not sow seed or reap or gather into storehouses. Isn't that true? Huh? The pigeons. Isn't that true? They don't work. Do they have to punch yeah. in? Yeah, they don't work. And yet they still eat, right? Mm -hmm. Because God still ordains their circumstances where they find food. Keep going. Yeah. yeah, your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not worth more than they are? Are you not worth more than what? They are. The birds. So if God loves birds who don't work and toil and make sure they're fed, these pigeons, they're fed. So they survive until the time that it's time for them to die. How much more is God concerned with your daily needs and he will provide for you if you don't lack faith and trust in him? Because mm -hmm. you are worth more than birds in the sight of God. And if he cares for birds, how much more you? He's arguing from the lesser to the greater. So keep going. Who of you by being anxious can add one cubit to his lifespan? Isn't that true? Yep. When you get paranoid and you worry, does that change your circumstances? Not at all. It just makes you sick and... <clears throat> Causes you depression and on top of that, causes you to be miserable because you can't sleep well. Because mm -hmm. worrying ain't going to change what's going to happen to me tomorrow. Let's say you got court, God forbid. Worrying about it ain't going to change the judge's decision and ain't going to stop that court date from coming to pass. So why don't you just rest in Christ, trust in the Lord, say, Lord, destroy my anxiety. Strengthen me by the spirit so I am not anxious for anything. Because whatever happens, you're in control and I trust in you. I know it's mm -hmm. hard, but we got to learn that. And I had to learn that even when I went through what I went through. But keep going. Also, why are you anxious about clothing? Take a lesson from the lilies of the field, how they grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yeah, do right? the so lilies and the flowers grow because they have to toil and spin? And No. Nope. Someone plants seeds, someone waters, and boom, there goes the lily, lilies. And by the way, guys, notice our Lord said lilies. He didn't say tulips, Calvinist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm laughing because this guy doesn't get the joke. <laughs> you didn't get the joke, right? No, I did not. Lilies are not tulips. They're not. Yeah. So the Lord said that the lily, see, even answering Adventism, who's reformed, laughed at that. Tulip is an acronym that describes a system belief of Calvinism because I used to be a Calvinist. So tulip, that's oh. a flower. 
So notice yeah. I'm taking a shot here because I used to be a Calvinist. The oh, lilies, yeah. he didn't mention no tulips answering Adventism. And by the way, anytime you want to come back, you know, my channel is your channel. Help that brother grow. He's destroying Adventism for the glory of Christ. Now keep going. All right. It says, um, but I tell you that not even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed as one of these. Now, well, let me explain what he means there. Have you ever been out to nature that hasn't been polluted and corrupted by humans? And you just go into, let's say, a forest and you see the magnificent beauty of the trees, of the fields, of the flowers, of the lilies, the magnificent beauty of the mountains and the oceans. And you stand in awe and you're blown away, right? Yes, yes. And so that's what the Lord's saying. Even Solomon, as wise as he was, as rich as he was. Even Solomon was not dressed in such splendor as the Lord God <clears throat> dresses the fields, makes the fields splendid with beauty and magnificence and the variety of flowers and so forth. Now, if God does that for a field, patch of grass or flowers here today, gone tomorrow, and he clothes them with such beauty and magnificence as a sign that the creator of such must be beautiful and magnificent. How much more will he clothe you when you are more valuable and precious than the lilies of the field? Mm -hmm. Finish it. You'll see. Now, this is how God clothes the vegetation of the field that is here today. And tomorrow is thrown into the oven. Will he not much rather clothe you? You with little faith. You understand what he's saying? Yeah. If God clothes, clothes the fields, the forests with such beautiful flowers, and lilies and even tulips okay, and trees and beautiful lush vegetation, animals pointing to his perfect wisdom and knowledge and beauty. And he does that for them. And they are worth less in his sight than your worth. How much more will he clothe you and love you and provide for you and protect you if you stop doubting and trusting in him? See, that's mm -hmm. the point. Now, in mentioning that, what did you learn? You are greater in value than the rest of creation. But finish it all the way to 34. So never be anxious and say, what are we to eat or what are we to drink or what are we to wear? For all these are the things the nations are eagerly pursuing. Yep. Your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Keep on then seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. So you see the advice? Focus on the rule of God. Make God's rule a reality in your life. Embrace God's rule in your life and live it out as a sign for others. And the Lord will bless you with your daily bread. That's why the prayer, are, and by the way, Matthew 6 is the same context where he teaches you the Lord's prayer. That's why in your Lord's prayer, you say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as, in, as, in, as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. So Jesus is now explaining that prayer. When you pray that, your kingdom and will be a reality in this world. Well, you're going to make it a reality by living out the rule of God's kingdom, by obeying his commands, making his rule a reality in your life. And when you do that, the Lord will provide your daily bread. So why yes. are you anxious? Now, what was the point going back to John 14, 28? You notice human beings are the, what they would say, the crown of God's creation of all creatures God bestowed humans with an honor and glory greater than all other creatures, even angels, before the fall. Before Adam and Eve fell, God created Adam and Eve to be the rulers over God's creation, including angels who were created to serve mankind, and they're only subject to God. So in the eyes of God, man is not just great in authority, but superior in nature. So I'm superior to my cat in nature, so I'm greater than my cat in authority and nature. However, I'm greater than my daughters in authority, but equal to them in nature because they are fully human. They are flesh of my flesh. So if they have my flesh, then they have the same nature I do. So how can they be inferior to me when they possess my flesh? Yep. So you understand the principle greater doesn't always mean better in nature, right? Yeah, 100%. Now, God is infinitely greater than every creature. He's not only greater in authority. In nature and value, God is infinitely greater in value and nature dignity than any creature in all creation combined. Okay, so yes, 
God is greater than me in authority and in nature. I'm his creature subject to him, depending on him. Is Jesus saying that I'm a creature and God is greater than me? Well, that's what your father thinks. Or is he saying, though I am the son, one with the father, still on earth, I voluntarily subject myself to the father to be a servant. And as a servant, he's now higher and greater than me in authority. Which of the two understandings fit the context? That's what we're looking at, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's find the answer. You ready? Yeah. Okay, now let's go back to John 14. So now let's see what the answer is contextually. Okay. Now I hope everyone else listening, you learn. I just gave you biblical basis to showing you humans are the crown of creation, superior in nature and value and authority to the rest of creation, specifically before the fall. But now because of the fall, part of our punishments that were subject to futility, to death and decay and sin and Satan. But in Christ, we are set free, glorified, what we say, theo theosisized, theosis, to be elevated to the status we had before Adam and Eve sinned. Okay, so that's what the Lord is doing. He's recapitulating, restoring us to our status, being the yeah. crown of creation. In Christ, and that's in Hebrews chapter 1 and 2. But anyway, you guys get the idea. Now, by the way, before we read John 14, let me show you where the Lord says, if you're a slave of the Lord and you're compassionate, like Jesus is compassionate and loving, then you are obligated to be compassionate and loving to the animals entrusted to your care. Let me show you that. Go to Proverbs 12, 10. Let me show that too. Proverbs 12, verse 10. As the Spirit anoints me to accurately call and interpret Scripture and then empower us to live it out. Proverbs 12, uh, verse 10. Verse 10 says, the righteous one takes care of his domestic animal. Wait, so if you're righteous, what do you do with your animal? You take care of them. Did you guys hear it? The righteous one, if you're righteous and just, you will care for your animal, your dogs, your cats. You won't abuse them. You won't harm them, and you won't abandon them. This is why I'm stuck with this cat. Before I had a cat, I could travel. Now, because of the cat, and I can't abandon the cat, and I'm in love with the cat, I have to now find a cat sitter. Yeah. Reread that again, Proverbs 12, verse 10. The righteous one takes care of his domestic animals, but even the mercy of the wicked is cruel. Well, yeah. Well, fish, you're not to abuse fish. And you're not to harm fish, but you can eat fish because our Lord ate fish. Mm -hmm. So this guy, I don't know if he's asking me what about fish, if he's just being a smart aleck, but it's all right. But I don't think so because he says the truth is in him. That's Ephesians 4.21. Okay, so you guys see it? The righteous man is even kind and compassionate to animals. How much more to fellow human beings? But then read the second part. Uh, verse 10. Yes, because you read the first time. The righteous man is kind to his domesticate, domesticated animals, right? Yeah. The second part says, but even the mercy of the wicked is cruel. You know what that means? Now, understand what Proverbs is saying. A righteous man is even compassionate and loving and caring for an animal. How much more for his fellow human being? But someone who's cruel and wicked, even when he shows you mercy, even that mercy is cruel because he's not doing it from a compassionate heart. He's doing it to either belittle you and show you that you are nothing and you need him or to gloat and boast of how great he is. Yeah, I understand. You see the wisdom there? Mm -hmm. A cruel man, even when he's merciful, even his mercy is cruel. Why? Because he's not doing it out of love and compassion. He's doing it to show you and belittle you that you need him and you're nothing without him and he's better than you and to boast and gloat. See how that I understand. works? So are we, if we love Jesus, not only compassion to one another, but even to animals? Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of which, I got to go check my cat because this verse, I need to practice what I preach. I don't want to be a hypocrite like full armor apologetics. Now, go to Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. Let me give you another example. Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. I read it out loud. Uh, 25, verse 4 says, You must not muzzle a bull when it is threshing out grain. Now, you may not understand why that command, because you, they would use oxen to tread the field, to hollow the field so they could plant, right? Okay. Now, but if you have an oxen, what's the oxen going to do? It's going to eat from the field, right? From the ground, right? Yeah. But some people were so wicked, they would put a muzzle not allowing the ox or the oxen to eat. Interesting. So what did God say? If you have oxen treading the field, hollowing the ground for you, 
you better not be so cruel as to muzzle them because you don't want them to eat from the field. You let them eat because they're working for you. Mm -hmm. You see how much God loves even animals? Yep. Now, did you know what Paul did with this example? No. He used this example to show if God loves animals that much, that he demands humans to reward them for working for them, how much more should you reward those who serve you, who are fellow human beings and image bearers of God. He took this very passage as an illustration. Do you know that? No, I did not. Well, let me show you. 1 Corinthians 9, 8. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 9, verses 8 all the way to 18. Read it. It's right there. And you're going to see it's in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 8. You're going to read it all the way to 12. But you're going to read 1 Corinthians 9, 8 to 18 to see what Paul says. But notice in verse 8. 9, 10, you're going to see him using this as an illustration. He's going to quote Deuteronomy 25, 4. Watch here. All right. It says, I am saying these things from a human viewpoint, or does not the law also say these things? For it is written in the law of Moses, you must not muzzle a bull when it is threshing out grain. Where did you just read that? De Deuteronomy. So in 1 Corinthians 9, 9, read verse 9 again. For it is written in the law of Moses, you must not muzzle a bull when it is threshing out grain. So Paul, brethren, Paul quotes Deuteronomy 25, 4 about not muzzling an oxen when it's shredding out the grain for you, let it eat, the labor is worthy of his wages, to use that as an illustration of the necessity to then provide food and raiment for men who are serving you spiritual food through preaching the gospel. Keep reading. Or is it... Um... It says, is it bulls that God is concerned about? Or now, is what is his point? Now, again, read 9 and 10 so I can show you his point. For it is written in the law of Moses, you must not muzzle a bull when it is threshing out grain. Is it bulls that God is concerned about? Or is it actually for our sakes that he says it? Did you catch what he's saying, guys? Understand the wisdom that God has given Paul and the insight. Did you hear what Paul said? He quoted yeah. Deuteronomy 25, 4. And he's saying, do you think God was concerned about bulls? In reality, what he means is this. Do you think that when God said that, he was saying that because he's concerned only about bulls? Or was he using that to teach a more deeper, greater spiritual truth? Are you guys listening? Mm -hmm. I know you're listening. I'm going to make sure everyone else, because they're benefiting from this. You understand what Paul did? This is a principle that every one of you need to follow. It May the Holy Spirit etch this principle in the hearts and souls and minds and tongues of all of us. Paul just showed you everything written was written deliberately to point to a greater spiritual reality. That's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying when God wrote that, yeah, he's concerned about oxen, but it wasn't only oxen he had in mind. He used that to point to a greater spiritual reality. And what is that greater spiritual principle that you need to discover by the Holy Spirit illuminating you? That if an animal is to be repaid for his or her effort, how much more your fellow human being who is serving you, especially if he's serving you the spiritual word of God, spiritual food. Argument from the lesser to the greater. So this is a principle from the New Testament. Look beyond just the plain reading of the Old Testament. All these things are there to point to a greater reality, a spiritual meaning that you need to unlock and then act upon. Did you guys get it? Yes. All right, now continue finishing. That was 10. Keep all the way to 18. Uh, okay, so 11. If we have some spiritual things among you, is it too much if we read material support from you? See what he's saying? We yeah. have sown spiritual seed. We preach the gospel. We taught you the gospel. We taught you how to understand and live it. Now, what do we reap? A material blessing from you. If I've sown spiritually in your life, then you reap. I reap from that. What do I reap? You reap what you sow? A material blessing. In other words, feed the man of God. Provide for the man of God in his ministry. But now watch why Paul is my hero. What Paul is saying is, as an apostle, it is my duty to receive a material blessing from you to repay me for the work of the Lord, because the Lord says the labor is worthy of his wages, but I will not take advantage of my duty. Watch what he says. Keep reading. If other men have this rightful claim over you, do we not have it much more so? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we are enduring all things so that we might not in any way hinder the good news about Christ. 
Do you not know that the men performing sacred duties eat the things of the temple? Do you, and and yet it's true, right? Those of you know the Old Testament, mm -hmm. when the priests served in the temple, their reward was they would eat the sacrifices that were offered. That was their payment for their service. They ate from what the Israelites contributed to the temple, right? The tithe, the meats, they would eat it because that was their due for their service for God. And that's what Paul is saying. Those who serve the Lord and serve you for saying, Lord, they reap a material blessing from you. Mm -hmm. But watch what Paul says. In this way, too, the Lord commanded for those proclaiming the good news to live by louder so we can hear you in this way, too. In this way, too, the Lord commanded for those proclaiming the good news to live by means of the good news. Did you hear it? Those who preach the gospel, the Lord has ordained that those who hear the gospel and believe will then support those who preach the gospel. But here's why I love Paul. Watch his heart. Why do you think I pray, Lord, please make all of us Pauls. Women, make them Paulas, make men Paul. Not for the praise of men, but so that we can love you, Lord Jesus, the way Paul loved you. So that we can know we are pleasing to you. Because look what he's going to say, guys. Pay attention to this. Why do you think I love this man? Keep reading. But I have not made use of a single one of these provisions. Indeed, I have not written these things so that this would be done for me. For it would be better to die than no man than no man will take away my grounds for boasting. See what he's saying? Now, I'd rather die than have you provide for me financially to throw it in my face. Saying, see, Paul, you did it for money because I'm not doing it for money. I'm doing it because I love Jesus. And because I love Jesus, he commands me to love you and serve you. So I'd rather die than get money from you and you throw it in my face and rob me of this boast that I preach the gospel out of my love for Jesus, not for financial gain. I will never allow you to slander me that way, that I did it for financial gain, which is why I didn't ask you for money. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Now, if I am declaring the good news, it is no reason for me to boast, for necessity is laid upon me. Really, woe to me if I do not declare the good news. If I do this willingly, I have a reward. But even if I do it against my will, I still have a stewardship entrusted to me. Now, let me explain what he means here. This is where Calvinists will butcher scriptures. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend my brother answering Adventism. I'm just saying it. They will take certain passages where God does compel people against their will to do something and assume this is always the case. If you're going to be biblically balanced and you read the Bible clearly and contextually, God will at times compel you to do something against your will when he knows this is best for you and others. It's like a parent who will force their child to take, let's say, shots, to give you a bad example, or go to school or church against their will because they know this is better for them in the long run. But it doesn't mean God does it. In every circumstance, he will work through your choices to bring about a greater good. But there are times in which he will intervene and compel you. So what mm -hmm. Paul is saying is here is that I was compelled to preach the gospel. I didn't want to preach the gospel. I didn't want to have nothing to do with Jesus. But Jesus knocked me to the ground and now compels me to do it. So because I'm compelled, that means it's a stewardship. I'm entrusted with someone else's property and I better manage it well, or I'm going to get disciplined. I understand. So, okay, now finish it. All what then is my reward? Say that again. When I declare the good news, Start that again one more time. What then is my reward? That when I declare the good news, I may offer the good news without cost to avoid abusing my authority in the good news. You're at all the, way, all the way 18, right? Yeah, it's 18. Now, let me explain what Paul says. Why is my hero? You know what he said? He goes, one thing. No man will ever rob me of. And we're gonna, and this is all related, brother, because when the Holy Spirit shows up and he moves me to talk about topics, these are topics that he wants us to know. May he be glorified and his will be done. So you're going to learn a lot of things, not just on the Trinity. Because the Bible is not just about the Trinity. It's about how to love and worship mm -hmm. and glorify and honor the Trinity and how to live for the triune God. Because knowing the Trinity but not living for him just brings judgment. So we want to know how to live. And I pray I practice what I preach because I'm weak. I am weak. But now, let me explain what Paul said and why I love this man. He goes, no one will rob me of this boast that I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ without demanding payment. And because of that, no one can then slander me and say, Paul did it to make himself rich. No, wherever I went, I never demanded people to pay me for preaching the gospel. I preached it out of my love for Jesus because 
His love compels me to do it. And because I love the Lord, I love humanity for his sake because he loves his creation and is using me and others to bring them to salvation. So no one can rob me of this boast. Because of this passage, I have made it, I have made it a principle in my life. And I pray I live up to it and not be lip service. That whenever I'm invited to preach, I'll never ask for a penny. I'll never ask for a penny. Now, I'm not going to mention names. I know people who will not come to a church if it's not large enough to afford their speaking fee. And if you don't believe me, there are Christians listening. They will tell you that speakers have a speaker fee. So when you invite them, you have to pay them. I know of one individual who asked for $5,000 to $10,000 to speak at your church. Wow. I'm not lying. I know of a very famous apologist. I mentioned their names in the past. That this apologist, he can get anywhere from $10,000 to $20,000 to debate. Wow. I'm not lying. However, look at the attitude of Paul. What did Paul say? One thing you'll never rob me of is this boast. See, there you go, Aaron. I've seen a 10,000 fee before. Exactly. I'm not lying. And I know these people. And I know the people who know them who've told them. That's why some of these big names here. Challenge me on this. How many of those big names you see preaching in a small church of 10 or 50? You'll see these big names in huge churches seating 5,000 and having several, let's say, services. Because they charge speaker's fee. 5,000, 10,000, 20,000. And yet, Paul says... No one will rob me of this boast that wherever I went, I preached freely and I didn't demand a penny so that people will not accuse me that I'm doing it for money when I'm doing it out of my love for Jesus. No one will rob me of that boast. And may God give me the power to practice what I preach and I don't whore myself. And why do you think I pray that? You see now I pray it. Lord, do not let us prostitute, whore ourselves for money, fame, or to fall into sexual lust. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he's my hero. So when I'm invited, I say, look, they say, how much? I say, I don't charge. But if God puts in your heart for the traveling expenses, like plane ticket, fine. But I don't put a fee on it. And I'm not saying that I'm popular and I'm in demand. No, my attitude, hardly anyone's going to invite me. I don't blame them. I am what they call a liability. <laughs> but my point being, there are men who are the movers and shakers in Protestant evangelicalism, they charge exorbitant amounts of money to speak at your church or conferences or to debate. Shame on them. But I can tell you people I worked with who don't put a price or money, right? They may just ask for traveling accommodation, like plane ticket or, you know, a hotel or somewhere to sleep. I'm going to tell you who. Can I tell you who? Yeah. Okay. David Wood. I know him and I love him. We're like brothers. We get angry and sometimes he won't talk to me free. That's okay. I love the man and may God preserve him and his family and may the Lord preserve me as well. David Wood, man of integrity. Can I mention another person? Mm -hmm. Osama Dakdok. I have witnessed Osama Dakdok going to a church of 20 people in rural areas where the internet connection was bad and he doesn't ask for a dime. And he drives from place to place. And this place was a 16-hour drive. Wow. Usama Dakdok. Okay? Usama Dakdok. Unlike the Shia who charged Mahmoud Nusra Khan's mother $10,000 so they can prostitute her and treat her like a whore and do, do muta with her. Unlike Mahmoud, Mahmoud Nusra Khan, whose uncle charged him $10,000 to violate him. And as he watches kitty porn and beats little girls, Osama Dakdok doesn't ask for money. By the way, if you're wondering why, we got this sick, demonized Mohammedan. He's my stalker. He worships me. He can't get enough of me. He keeps imagining I'm his uncle because his uncle sodomized him and his uh, mother was known for being a Shia prostitute in Iran. Because I don't know if you know this, in Islam, you can prostitute a woman. It's called temporary marriage. That's crazy. And so his mother was known as an international Shia whore. And when she got pregnant with him, she still doesn't know which of the Shia fathered this bastard. And he's addicted to child pornography. 
like EA Dawa, and he likes to beat little girls. So he's projecting on me what his filthy dog, Muhammad, that bastard, that whore, did to Aisha and beat her. So I just want you to know he's here stalking me. And he worships he's me. He's here? Yeah, yeah. That's what I just blocked him. I saw him. He worships me, by the way. He cannot stop thinking of me. He sleeps thinking of me. He wakes up thinking of me. The dude is hoping that I was a sexual deviant like his uncle and maybe marry him. But I'm not gay and I'm not a deviant. We are slaves of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And he loves it when I humiliate his mother and I expose his mother because we have court documents that his mother is a whore in Iran. And he was violated by his uncle, and he likes to beat little girls. We have court documents from Iran, and he doesn't like that I have court documents. <laughs> anyway, brother, you okay? Yeah, I'm good. You're like, what happened? This dog, this bastard happened. But anyway, coming back to the issue, Osama Dakdok doesn't charge. If the church gives him a love offering, amen. But I know times in which churches haven't even given love offering, and out of his own pocket, he had to pay for the gas. David Wood, Osama Dakdok, right? El Fadi, another man of integrity. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about people to support. Christian Prince is another. He doesn't charge. These are men of integrity that do not charge exorbitant amounts for you to have them come to their church. Now, with that said, brother, all that was preparatory. You saw the word greater has one of two meanings, right? Yes. It can mean greater in, in position or greater nature, right? Mm -hmm. So what did Jesus mean? Now, let's look at the contents. Go to John 14. Now, let's see when Jesus says the Father is greater than I, in what sense? Let's see. Let's start. He started at 28. Well, let's back it up a few verses earlier. Let's go to verse 6. All right. It says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So I want your father to explain how can Jesus, a creature, claim to be the life when only God is the life and the source of life? Mm -hmm. Right? Who yeah. is the life? Who gives life according God. to the Old Testament? God, yeah. So challenge your dad. Say, Dad, can you show me a single example in the Old Testament when someone other than Jehovah is said to be the life? No, right? No. Now, he can explain in a way all he wants. The fact is, Jesus said, I am the life. But wait, I have yet to see any prophet or angelic creature say, I am the life, because we're told that Jehovah is the life. He is the fountain of life. You remember Psalm 36, verse 9? Mm -hmm. Reread now Psalm 36, verse 9. Go back. It says, with you is the source of life. By your light, we can see light. So Jehovah is the source of life? Yes. But Jesus says, I am the life. Now go to Deuteronomy 30, verse 20. Deuteronomy 30, verse 20. 30, verse 20? Mm -hmm. I don't know how they translate it, but we'll see. Because they may translate it different. Because, you know, it's a Jehovah's Witness Bible. Yeah, it says, By loving Jehovah your God, by listening to his voice, and by sticking to him, for he is your life. Who is your life? life? Jehovah. So they got it right. Reread that again. Good. They translated it correctly. I'm, I'm impressed. By loving Jehovah your God, by listening to his voice, and by sticking to him, for he is your life. And by him you will endure a long time in the land that Jehovah swore to give you, to give to your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So who is the life of believers? Jehovah. Who is the fountain of life? Jehovah. But Jesus says, I am the life. Yep. That was John 14, 6, right? Mm -hmm. But then go to John 11, 25, 26. John 11, 25 to 26. It says... Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who exercises faith in me, even though he dies, will come to life. And everyone who is living and exercises faith in me will never die at all. Do you believe this? So wait, who is the resurrection and the life? Jesus. Who said I'm the way, the truth, and the life? Jesus Christ. And in John 1, 4, what does John say about Jesus, the word, before he became flesh in John 1, 4? Um, that he was the true light. No, that's John 1, 9. Don't go oh. by memory because you're going to disappoint yourself. I know you're trying to be like me, but you can't be like me because I'm greater than you. <laughs> Get it? Greater than you? <laughs> for now, for now. John 1, 4. It says, by means, of him was, by means of him was life, and the life was the light of men. So who's the means of life? Who gives life to creation? Jesus. The word, right? Who's Jesus, right? Yeah, the word, yeah. And then John eleven twenty five, 25, he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Mm -hmm. And John 14, 16 says, I'm the way and truth and the life. Mm-hmm. 
And yet Psalm 36, 9 says, Jehovah is the fountain of life, and in his light we see light. And Deuteronomy 30, 20 says, Jehovah is our life. Yeah. How can Jesus, a creature, be our life, the resurrection and life, and be the means of life that he gives life to all creation if he's a creature? It would be, it would be a contradiction. Yeah, yeah. So why did he start at 28 but ignore verse 6? Yeah. But now go to John 14, 23. John 14, same chapter, right? Yeah, it says, uh, In answer, Jesus said to him, If anyone loves me, he will observe my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. So did you catch it? We will come to him and make our dwelling with him. So you asked your dad, How can Jesus claim to be just as present in the life of every believer as the Father is? We together will be with every true believer, no matter how many, no matter where they're at, and we equally will dwell with every one of them. Jesus is claiming to be equal to the Father in the Father's ability to be with every believer, to oversee him and protect him. Mm -hmm. Does that claim, does that sound like Jesus thinks that he's inferior to the Father? No. So again, I want to know as a Jehovah Witness, how can Jesus be just as present with every believer, no matter how many, no matter where they're at? Because he's saying every true believer, I'm going to be with him personally. And be present with all of them at the same time, the same way the Father is. Yeah. And, and also, I think Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will be with us as well. Yeah, John 14, 17, he shall be in you. That's John yeah. 14, 17. Trinity right there. You Say it again. The Trinity's right there. Right there. John 14, 17, he is with you, shall be in you. That's the Spirit of truth. And I and the Father are with every true believer at the same time. So Father, Son, and Spirit are omnipresent. Which, interestingly, the Joe's witnesses deny. Did you know that? Yeah, Jehovah, know, yeah. Jehovah Witness, if they've taught you, they believe Jehovah the Father has a spiritual body. And when that spiritual body is in heaven, and it's his active force, the spirit, that fills the earth. And it's through that active force that the Father is aware of what takes place in the earth. Mm -hmm. And I want everyone else to hear that. I don't know. He knows it because he was taught. Jehovah's Witnesses believe the Father has a spiritual body. And the Father, because he has a spiritual body, is in heaven so that he himself is not truly present with all creation. It's his active force that fills creation. And by his active force, he's aware of what takes place. Did you guys know that? Now, you knew that, but a lot of these people don't know that's what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. Mm -hmm. And you knew that. They taught you that, right? Yeah. All right. Now, with that said... You want your dad to explain how can a creature be the life when Jehovah's our life? And how can Jesus say he's truly present with every believer, no matter how many, no matter where they're at, with all of them at the same time to oversee them, to watch over them, to protect them to the same extent the Father is? Doesn't that show that Jesus is equal to the Father? Mm -hmm, it does. Okay, but we got more for our buddy old pal, daddy of mine. John 14, 12 to 14. Now, I'm going to show you something that the society did. Get ready for now the society not being faithful to their own interlinear, deciding to go with some other Greek manuscripts as opposed to the collated Greek text that they themselves publish and use. Watch their dishonesty. John 14, 12 to 14. And I'm, I'm pretty sure I think I know what you're going to say. All right. But it read says, John 14, 12 first. All right, it says, most truly I say to you, whoever exercises faith in me will also do the works that I do, and he will do works greater than me. There's that word greater again. Same yeah. chapter, right? That's that word yeah. greater again. Yeah. Now, I want to ask you a question. Jesus says, the same works I've been doing, they will do, but greater works than these. In what way will the disciples do greater works than Jesus? I mean, I would say more, like they would do more. Works. Exactly. Because... They can't do better miracles than Jesus. No. And he even says, you're going to do the works I've been doing. So it's the same works, right? Yeah. But he says greater. So here again is proof that the word greater doesn't mean in quality. It's not going to be better in quality. They're going to do the same works, but a greater number because they're going to reach more people and do more miracles. So you're going to do a greater number. So here again is proof greater doesn't mean better in quality, right? Mm -hmm. But then he explains the reason why they're going to do greater work. So we read it again. Most truly I say to you, whoever exercises faith in me will also do the works that I do, 
and he will do works greater than these because I am going my way to the Father. So that explains why. He goes, the reason why you're going to do greater works than I've been doing, because I'm going my way to the Father. So notice there's a connection. When I go to the Father, you will then do greater number of works that I was doing. You will do but a greater number. When? When I go to the Father. So then you ask your dad, why is it? That Jesus, when he goes to the Father, then, and because of him going to the Father, disciples will be doing a greater number of works. You don't need to let him answer. He say, because of verse 13. It's the answer's right there. Verse 13. Also, whatever you, whatever you ask in my name, I will do this. That's so the answer. So are they going to do a greater number of works when he goes to the Father? Because whatever they ask in Jesus' name, Jesus will do it. Jesus is the one doing the miracles from heaven. Mm -hmm. that's the answer. When I return to the Father, and you ask in my name, from heaven, I will be the one doing the miracles through you. So it's not them doing it. It's Jesus with the Father, as well as the Holy Spirit, doing the miracles through them. So it will be Jesus who will raise the dead when they ask him to. It will be Jesus casting out demons when they ask him to. It will be Jesus healing the sick and giving sight to the blind when he's in heaven. For his followers on earth, he's doing it. So when I return, I will be doing the miracles for you. Mm -hmm. So reread 13 and 14. Also, whatever you ask in my name, I will do this so that the Father may be glorified in connection with the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So who's going to be doing the miracles? Jesus. Elsewhere, he says it's the Father in my name. Why? Because Father, Son, and Spirit work together. That's why we believe in the Trinity, right? Amen. But don't let your dad run to another pastor. No, no, dad. Yeah, I know the father's doing it. I didn't say he's not doing it. But the father's doing it with the son and the spirit. They're doing it together and equally. It's not one it and not the right other. There, yeah. Right? Because he's going to try to run. Play. Well, John 15, 16 says the father's going to do it. Yeah, dad, I believe the father does it. But you're ignoring the fact the father is not the only one. The father with his son and the spirit are doing the miracles. They're doing it together, dad. Mm -hmm. So make sure you emphasize that. But the question becomes... What kind of ability must Jesus have that from heaven, no matter how many are asking and no matter what they're asking for, he will be the one by his power doing the miracles for them? What kind of ability must off? he have? Why haven't you cut off for a second? Sorry. I'll bust you up, sir, and then repent. What kind of ability must Jesus have that from heaven, no matter how many followers there are, no matter how many people ask him, no matter what they ask him for, he has the ability to do it all. He's, it only makes sense that he's God. Yeah, so what specific qualities must God have to do that? Think about it. I mean, uh, he has to be, what's the word, like omniscient? You got it. He must know, right? Yeah. And he must have the power to do it, right? Yeah. And he must be able to be present in these places to do it no matter where they're at, right? Yes. Now, I'll give you proof that Jesus did the miracles. Let me now give you some examples. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. In Acts 3, Peter and John healed the paralytic in whose name? Open up Acts 3. As they were going up to the temple, Acts 3, verses 1 to 11. I want you to see it. As they're going up to the temple, it was the ninth hour, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, to pray. There was a beggar, a paralytic, one paralyzed. So yeah. Peter looks at him and says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. And in whose name did he heal him? In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. So then they picked him up, and immediately he started leaping and running, and he was instantly healed. In whose name? Jesus' name. So just like Jesus said, when I go to heaven, you will ask in my name, and I'll do it. Mm -hmm. And then when the people are looking and astonished, Peter uses this physical miracle to show Jesus is now. Pick it up at Acts 3, read 12 to 16. When Peter saw this, he said to the people, men of, men of Israel, why are you so amazed at this? And why are you staring at us as though by personal power or godly devotion we have made him walk? So why are you looking at me thinking because I'm pious, I did it by my power. And by the way, yeah. Lepant, everyone else, this is what communion of saints means. The saints intercede and ask the triune God to do the miracle because the saints do not have the power to do it. It is the power of God that they're invoking to do it. So here's an example. Now keep going. 
the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our forefathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you handed over and disowned before Pilate, even though he had decided to release him. Yes, you disowned that holy and righteous one, and you asked for a man who was a murderer to be given to you, whereas you killed the chief agent of life, but God raised them up from the dead. That's of right. Which fact we are witnesses. Now go back to 12 and 13. One more time, 12 and 13. When Peter saw this, he said to the to the people, "Men of Israel, why are you so amazed at this? And why are you staring at us as though by personal power or godly devotion we have made him walk? Mm -hmm. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our forefathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and disowned before Pilate." That's right. Now in sixteen, what do they say? And through his name and by our faith in his name, whose name? Jesus's. What did Jesus say? You will ask in my name, and I will do it. Yeah. So now they're saying, who did the miracle? Read 16 again. And through his name and by our faith in his name, this man whom you see and know has been made strong. Wow. In his name and faith in his name, this man was miraculously healed in front of your sight. What did Jesus say? When I go to my father, you'll ask my name and I will do it, right? Mm -hmm. And is that what they did? Yes. They ask in Jesus' name. And so now, according to John 14, who did the miracle? Jesus. Not only Jesus. Jesus and the Father and the Spirit together, right? Because Yes, yes. But uh, Jesus definitely is doing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we caught that, right? Yeah. Now, when they go before the chief priests and the scribes and the rulers, because they cause a commotion, and they ask Peter and John, with the paralyzed man standing with them whole, by what power, by what name did you do this? So go to Acts 4. And read 5 to 14. Acts 4. Read verses 5 to 14. Now, when you get to 8, I want you to read it slowly because I want to show what the society did with this verse. Let's see if we catch it. Acts chapter 4, chapter 4, verses 5 to 14. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem, along with Annas, the chief priest, Caiaphas, Caiaphas, <laughs> John, Alexander, and all who were relatives of the chief priest. They stood Peter and John in their midst and began to question them. By what power or in whose name did you do this? Now, the reason why the Jews are asking, because for, according to the Old Testament, the only power and name that can heal is Jehovah. Mm -hmm. So now they're wondering, okay, Peter and John, you're Jews, and you are children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you believe the Old Testament. And as Jews, the only name and power you can invoke is the name of Jehovah, because if you're believers, you can't invoke the name of another God or a creature. So now they're wondering, whose name and power did this miracle? Now, the answer should be Jehovah, right? Yeah. Now notice now in verse 8, what does it say? Then Peter, filled with Holy Spirit. Now, did you catch it? Now, guys, pay attention. He read it, but you're not seeing it. It says, Peter, filled with Holy Spirit, lowercase h, lowercase s. Mm -hmm. and no definite article. So it doesn't say filled with the Holy Spirit, capital H, capital S, because they don't believe the Holy Spirit is a person. So at times they don't put the word the Holy Spirit. They put with Holy Spirit, lowercase h, lowercase s, and this is blasphemy to the Holy Spirit. Yep. But anyway, notice now for those of you listening, who now is going to fill Peter and empower Peter what to say, the Holy Spirit. Who's going to make Peter bold and fearless and not fear the backlash and give him the words to say to silence Jesus' enemies? The Holy Spirit. So mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit now fills him. So what does the Holy Spirit have him say? Keep going. Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed to a crippled man and you want to know who made this man well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you executed on a stake, but whom God raised up from the dead, by means of him, this man stands here healthy in front of you. Say what? Whose name? Jesus Christ. Of Na Jesus Christ of Nazareth, right? Yes. Jesus said, when I go to the Father, you'll ask in my name and I will do it. And whose name are they invoking? Jesus Christ. And yet the Jews are shocked. Jesus Christ, a Jew? He's the one who's doing the miracles. He's the one empowering you to do these miracles. The one we handed over and killed. Yeah, because he's not dead. He's been raised and he's alive. And here's the proof. If he was dead and he was a false Messiah, 
We couldn't use his name to make this man whole, but here he is in front of your eyes. Now, then he uses that miracle to do something more astonishing. Keep going. This is the stone. This is the stone that was treated by you builders as of no account that has become the chief cornerstone. Furthermore, there is no salvation in anyone else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must get saved. Utter blasphemy if Jesus is a creature. And I emphasize that to your dad. Dad, you don't believe Jesus is Jehovah, but he just said there is no other name, no other person that can save and does save on earth except Jesus. But dad, Jesus is not Jehovah, right? Yeah. Well, Peter and you are blasphemers. Why? The Old Testament says Jehovah alone is the God who saves, and he saves because of his name, not the name of someone else. Did you know that? Yes. So can you show your dad those verses? Um, I don't know the exact verses. Exactly. No. So you know it, but you don't know the verses. So why don't you just be humble and say, no, I don't know, Sam. I'm pretending to know. <laughs> I'm not pretending. I just don't know the exact verses. Okay. Now let me show you that Peter, a Jew who knows the Old Testament, just told you Jesus is Jehovah God. Because what he said can only be said of Jehovah. It's Jehovah's name alone that saves. And Jehovah's the only one who saves from sin. And he does so for his name. Let me show it to you. Now, okay. before I show it to you, reread Acts 4.12 and then all the way to 14 so I can finish this up and then make the connection for your dad. To show your dad, dad, you got problems because you believe this is the Archangel Michael. So read 12 again, Acts okay. 4.12 to 14. It says, furthermore, there is no salvation in anyone else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must get, must get saved. Now, when they saw the outspokenness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were astonished and they began to realize that they had been with Jesus. So catch the point of Luke here, what Luke wants you to see. They were not formally trained. Uneducated means they didn't go to rabbinic school. They were not taught by rabbis. They were not taught the Old Testament. And they were ordinary men. But then notice what the text says, if you're paying attention. <clears throat> They've been with Jesus. You know why Luke wrote that? Because wow. the point of Luke is you don't need to go to seminary. You don't need to go to Bible college. Mm -hmm. You need to spend time at the feet of Jesus and trust Jesus teach you by the Spirit. And he'll make you so qualified that you're going to make scholars look stupid. Yes. It's not going to seminary. It's not going to Bible college that will educate you to know your faith. It's spending time with Jesus personal, intimate, quality time with Jesus through prayer, through studying his word, meditating on his word, acting upon his word, through fasting, through worshiping your Lord, and through that intimate relationship with the living Lord who's with you. Because what did Jesus say? If you love me, I'm going to be with you. Yes. Then the Lord will fill you with his wisdom to silence the scholars of this age. You see that part? It says, and they took note they had been with Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yep. I don't need seminary, cemetery, or Bible college. I need my Jesus, my Lord, by spending time with him, meditating on his word, reflecting on his word, speaking to him in prayer, talking to him, not just for what I want. Lord, give me telling him that I love him and thanking him for being with me, loving me, and guiding me, and watching over me, and for saving me for myself so I don't shame him but honor him. Amen. As you do that, you get to know him. And when you get to know him, see, it's a relationship. It's a marriage. When you get to know the character of your spouse, you, you're married and you get to know your spouse and you know her inside and out, or you know him inside and out, your best of friends. Through that relationship, by knowing your spouse, you know when someone's lying about your spouse or telling the truth because you know them personally. When you know someone personally, it becomes easier for you to explain who that person is and defend their character. Yep. It's a relationship. But now you see that word ordinary? You know what it is yeah. in Greek? No. It's idiot. Oh. I'm not lying. The Greek word for ordinary is idiote. It means idiot. So in other words, it says they were uneducated idiots. Wow. Yeah, let me show it to you. You think I'm lying, huh? See, so you, you see this how you are, bro. You think you're better than me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now go open up your kingdom into linear. Yes, sir. And I'm going to give Bible up for everyone else if they can't read the Greek. When you go to Acts 4.13, 
you're going to see in their interlinear the word idiote or idiotai. Idiotai! Chumbi! Ato! Ato de! Samurai Sunday. Here, let me show it for the rest of you guys. That's where you get the word idiot. So proving 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 29, Jesus chose a group of fishermen who from the world's standard were uneducated idiots to silence these scholars and embarrass them. Yep. Okay, so here it is. Do you see the word ordinary? Idiotai. Mm -hmm. Do you guys see it? Here it is. You can even see it. It's I-D-I-W-T-A-I. -I -I. It's idiotai. Here it is, guys. Click on it. Don't take my word for it. There it is. They're interlinear. You can see it. Even if you can't read Greek, you can spell it out. I-D-I-W-T-A-I. -I. The W is an O. It's idiotai. Idiote. Idiots. They're uneducated idiots. Jesus takes uneducated idiots and fills them with the wisdom of God to destroy and confound the wisdom of the scholars of this age. Yep. You guys see that? So you guys catching it, right? Now, you read 13. Now, could the Jews then silence them and refute them? No, because read Acts 4.14. Go back to the Bible and read Acts 4.14. It says, as they were looking at the man who had been cured standing with them, they had nothing to say in answer to this. Did you catch it? You see how mm -hmm. Jesus embarrassed them? They were seeing the man miraculously healed, physically standing whole, his feet whole. Now he can run and leap better than before. So they're seeing the miracle. And they can't deny it. Well, here's the miracle. The man is healed. Yep. So they're not lying because here's the man. But how in the world could they have healed him in the name of Jesus? What are they trying to get, get at? Now, how does this prove, by the way, Jesus is God? Remember what Peter said in Acts 4, 12? There is no other name, no other person given under heaven to men on earth by which someone can be saved. If Jesus is a creature, it's blasphemy, Jehovah Witness, because let me prove it to you. Go to Psalm 25, 11. Who alone forgives sins and saves? Because he's not just talking about physical healing. He's saying about salvation. Who alone saves from sin and wrath? And for whose name does he do it? Psalm 25, 11. It says, for the sake of your name, O Jehovah, forgive my error, though it is great. For whose name's sake? Jehovah. But wait, why did Peter, who's a Jew and knows the Old Testament, say it in the name of Jesus Christ and his name alone? Yep. Are you seeing the problem you're going to create for your dad right now? Yeah. Psalm 25, 11. Now, Psalm 54, 1. It says, Oh God, save me by your name and defend me with your power. Whose name saves? God's. But Peter said Jesus and his name alone. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing the problem? Yes. Now go to Psalm 78. <clears throat> well, go to Psalm 79, 9. Psalm 79.9. 78.38 is about Jehovah making atonement. Go to Psalm 79.9. It says, Help us, O God of our salvation, for the sake of your glorious name. Rescue us and forgive our sins for the sake of your name. So whose name's sake does Jehovah forgive you of your sins and saves you from your sins? Jehovah God. So are you guys, all of you, seeing it? Psalm 25, 11, 54, 1, Psalm 99.9. Jehovah will save you from your sins and forgive you of your sins. By his power for the sake of his name. But Peter said in Acts 4.12, it is Jesus and the name of Jesus alone, no one else, that saves people from their sins, which contradicts the Old Testament of Jesus is not Jehovah. Yep. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Now go to Isaiah 43.25. And this is their Bible you're reading, right? Yes. There you go. Isaiah 43.25. 43. 25, mm -hmm. it says, I I am the one who is blotting out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. For whose sake? His own, uh, God's own sake. But Peter says, for the sake of Jesus and the basis of his name. Yep. So if Peter is a Jew who's faithful to the Old Testament, the only way he can say this is about Jesus is if Jesus is Jehovah Almighty in the flesh. Because if Jesus is a creature, he just contradicted the Old Testament and committed idolatry. Yeah, exactly. And this is the Jehovah Witness Bible. So don't let your dad run from it. Say, no, dad, your theology, you end up in committing idolatry. You want me to now commit idolatry. Because you're saying Jesus is a creature and he's the archangel Michael. This is blasphemy according to the Old Testament, dad. Right? 
yeah. then the final nugget for you, Isaiah, the tight end, and we're done with John 14. Then I'm going to explain why he says what he says in John 14. And then we're going to go to the second question. So we do a part three. That's okay. It depends on you because I can be here six hours, but you, you need beauty sleep. No, I'm kidding. Now <laughs> go to Isaiah 45, 21 to 22. Isaiah 45, 21 to 22. It says, make your report, present your case, let them consult together in unity, who foretold this long ago and declared slowly. it from time to Slowly. Read past. it like slowly so we can understand, right? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll restart. Not too slow, but, you know, slow where we can get it. All right. Make your report, present your case, let them consult together in unity, who foretold this long ago and declared it from times past. Is it not I, Jehovah? There is no other God but me. A righteous God and a savior. There's none besides me. So he's the only God that saves, right? Yeah. And then now watch. Keep reading. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there's no one else. So who must the nations and the ends of the earth turn to and believe in to be saved? Jehovah. But Peter said, salvation is found in no one else, and there is no other name given under heaven, meaning throughout the earth, except the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But Jehovah said, the ends of the earth, everyone under heaven must turn to me to be saved because I'm the only God who saves, right? Mm -hmm. But according to your dad, Jesus is a God, lowercase g, whose name alone saves blasphemy and idolatry. Blasphemous. You caught it, right? <laughs> Was that you saying blasphemous? Yeah, yeah. For a minute, your voice changed. How many are you? No, just me. So you're sure you're not legion? No, I'm just kidding, man. <laughs> but you got it, right? Yeah. Okay, so we took care of John 14, but now let me explain what the Lord meant. John 14, 20. Now, let's, now that we got that out of the way, now let's explain what he meant. Okay, so then why do he say the Father's going to... Well, we know he's on earth as a status of a slave. So the Father's higher in status, and he's dwelling in his glory in heaven, right? Yeah. Where Jesus veiled his glory. But if you actually read it, you're going to see that's Jesus' point, that as long as I'm here, the Father is greater than I. Because now let's reread it with now the correct lenses given to us by the Spirit. Now, guys, listen to the words of our Lord. And this should move you in your spirit to cry how beautiful Jesus is and how deep his love is for us and why we cannot love him enough. So go to John 14, 28. Now let's understand in context. So I read 28. Yes. You heard that I said to you, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I am. See, why don't they ever finish the verse? Because he says, if you really love me, you won't be sad, because they were heartbroken. Jesus saying, for a little while you won't see me, then you're going to see me, but then I'm going to go to the Father. And so they're heartbroken. If you read John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, you're going to see they're heartbroken because they don't understand why that Jesus is going away, because they still don't get it. So he's saying, instead of being heartbroken and sad, you should be happy for me if you love me that I'm going to the Father. So mm -hmm. there right there means there's something deeper. If you love me truly, then why are you sad for me? Don't you want what's best for me? After all, if I remain on earth, the Father will be greater in glory and status because he's in heaven, appearing in his visible glory on the throne, while I'm here as a slave, with my glory veiled, being mistreated, being abused, spit on, insulted, and then beaten and killed. Is that what you want for me or you want what's best for me? Now, if I love Jesus, I say, Lord, I want what's best for you, what you deserve to be mm -hmm. enthroned and everyone worshiping you. Then you should rejoice that I'm going to the Father, not be sad. Because if I stay, he'll be greater than me. But when I return, I will then be equal to him in glory on the throne with him reigning. Isn't that what you want for me if you love me? Mm -hmm. So that's what he's saying. So when you understand it that way, it should move you. See, I'm getting moved in my spirit thinking about it. So he's telling Peter, Peter, don't be sad for me. Don't be heartbroken because you will be with me forever and you'll see me in glory and reign with me. But if you really love me, Peter, do you want me to remain on earth mistreated, abused, insulted, disrespected? And then you're going to see me beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death. Nailed to the cross with spikes in my hands and feet, gasping for air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that what you want? No. I want to see you glorified and receiving what you deserve. Then rejoice that I'm going to the Father. Because if I remain here, the Father will be greater than I. But when I return, then I will be again 
bask in the same glory with the Father, and then our status will be equal one and the same. And mm -hmm. that's what he says in John 17, 5. Go read John 17, 5 for the answer. So now that's his point. He's encouraging them. Don't be sad that I'm leaving because you'll be with me. Because in John 14, what did he say? Before you go there, remember in John 14 where he says, I prepare a place for you in my mm -hmm. father's house. And if I prepare a place, I will come and receive you to be with me where I am. Mm -hmm. So that's what he's telling them. I will go to the father, but you'll be with me. Because in John 14, verse 1 to 6, he already told them, I'm preparing places for you in my father's house in heaven. So when it's time for you, Peter or John or James to die, I will come and take you to be with me, to see me in that glory with the Father, where you'll see and realize no longer is the Father higher than me because now equal with the Father, enthroned alongside of him. Mm -hmm. So then that's why it says in this prayer in John 17, 5. It says, so now, Father, glorify me at your side with the glory that I had alongside you before the world was. That's what he means. So if I'm on earth, does he have that glory? No. Because read it. Glorify me with the glory I had uh -huh. at your side, mm. right, before the creation of the world. Meaning, on earth, he doesn't have it, right? Nope. So when is he going to have it? When um, he goes to heaven. You got it right there. So understand the love of Jesus. Jesus voluntarily, willfully set aside his heavenly glory where he appeared before the angels as their God and king, reigning with the Father. Because he veiled himself so they didn't see him visibly in heaven. Because now visibly he's on earth. <clears throat> and he gave that up in order to become a slave. To love you and live the life you're supposed to live. And die the death you're supposed to die. So he can save you so you can dwell with him forever. And he voluntarily did that because he loves you and wants to save you. He didn't have to, mm -hmm. but he chose it, right? That's why there's that song. There's a beautiful song about how many kings have given up their thrones for me. Let me play that clip real quickly because I can't play too much of it because I'm going to get a, yeah, I'm probably taking a rest. They'll probably flag me. Uh, let me see. I don't want to play too much of it because I don't want them to take it down. There goes my scary toes. Here, this is the song. It's called How Many Kings. Beautiful song. Let me play a few minutes of it. I can't play because I don't want them to hear. This is the song that captures it. Guys, you can find that on YouTube. It's called How Many Kings. Right? Put Jesus, how many kings? Beautiful song. Even hearing it, I want to cry. Angels. I just sing the words I want to cry. <laughs> Now here's the part. How many kings and thrones? How many lords? I can't play all of it. I don't want to get flagged, but you get it, right? Yes. So there you go. That's the thing. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Lord of Glory, stepped down from his throne and walked as a peasant servant to show you that he loves you from the depth of his being. But anyway, so now we got the answer, John 14, 20, right? Yes, sir. And you know what's sad and disheartening? Mm. Because of this satanic cult, Joe's Witnesses, your father has been blinded to seeing the true Jesus and the depth of his love for him. Yeah, that's, that's something that... that... I kind of realized that um, they kind of down, they do downplay Jesus and the sacrifice doesn't seem as meaningful. Because they don't know Jesus. Yeah. That's See, when you that, get to know the real that. Jesus, you get to know the real Jesus, you stand yeah. in awe and you just are filled with love and joy from the spirit because you cannot help but fall in love with him because how beautiful, loving and merciful he is. Mm -hmm. But they I don't agree. know Jesus. They have a counterfeit. Now, that was the first question. It took me three hours. I'm sorry. Hopefully the other questions won't take as long. What's the other <laughs> it's one? Okay. Um, I guess, yeah, I mean, the next one I think would is, is a pretty easy 
uh, question. I just don't know probably like the all the ways to answer it. But oh, yeah, what is it? Um, when I think it was the the rich man, he called Jesus like good teacher. Oh, and I just did a session said, on that, brother. Instead oh, of me did? answering, yeah, it, I answered it for that ex-Muslim. If you go back just a couple days ago, go to my YouTube channel. I, I say ex-Muslim, just right before you contacted me, he brought okay. up Luke 18, 19, which is the where he says, why do you call me good? There's none good uh, but God alone. That's yes. Luke 8, and it's found in Mark 10, 18 and Matthew 19, 17. I just did a session where that was one of his questions, and I went in depth, and I wrote an article for him. So instead of having to answer that, it's already answered for you. So if you go to my YouTube channel and you go to where it says live, click on it. Do you see where it says ex-Muslim? Mm -hmm. What does it say? It says ex-Muslim has questions. Oh, no, it discusses Jesus' deity. That's the one. So that one I deal with, why do you call me good? And if you go to my YouTube channel, search engine, Jesus, God, good. I've done other sessions, but I wrote an article on Luke on this. Let me get you the article. So to save time on that one, because I already answered just recently, right? Okay. I just answered that recently. So let me get you the article I wrote, right, on this Luke 18, 19. Here it is. Luke on Jesus's essential goodness. Here it is. Now I want you to click on it, okay? I just mm -hmm. sent it to you guys there. It's right there, guys. I, the article, I just wrote it. Now I'm going to send it to you here on Skype. I just wrote this about four days ago for that ex-Muslim okay. because... He asked me about Luke 18, 19. I did articles on Mark 10, 17, 18, and Matthew 19, 16, 17. But I didn't comment on the Lucan version, Luke 18, 19. It's the same story, but in the three Gospels. So I said, I'm uh, going to write one here. So here it is for you. Now, if you click you. on it, click on it. Yeah. You'll see there that I begin with Luke 18, 18, 19. No one is good but God alone, right? Mm -hmm. And then I explain it and show how Jesus actually was asking question to show the man that he's claiming to be God. And then at the end, if you go down all the way to the bottom, you see where it says further re reading? Yes. Now, in all of my articles, I try to post to other articles and rebuttals that go even more in depth. So in here, I give you links to articles and rebuttals where I deal with Mark 10, Matthew 19, same story, but from Ma Mark and Matthew and go in depth. So in that bottom of that article, it says further reading. What's the names of the articles that you see? Name them for me. It says Jesus Christ, the absolutely and essential good God. That's using this statement. Why do you call me good to show that he's actually God? What else? How can Jesus be God when he says that only God is good? Same argument. That's your father. Jesus said only the father. God is good. That's that's an article I wrote on that. What else? Then the last two are addressing William's fake False allegations, part three and part four. Yeah, in part three and part four, I deal with Mark 10, 17, 18, where it's the same story. Why do you call me good? And in Matthew 19, 16, 17, same story. So now okay. I've dealt with all three versions of the story. The rich man okay. saying, good master. All three. It's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So there you go. That should save time. Listen to session, read the articles. So we can go to the other questions. So I hope that's okay. No, yeah, that, that, that's probably fine. Um, now for the rest of you, you got the link and seeing this link in the article. Dealing with the Luke conversion, at the bottom I link to other rebuttals. For you guys to study, learn them, understand them, share them accurately, and use information to build up the body of Christ. Everyone got it? Now go ahead with the other question. So this, this question I kind of don't really know how to ask, but one of the things that he kind of brought up was like, okay, so if Jesus is God, when he died, what happened like to God, because he, I guess he thinks that maybe God yeah, has no. to be. Yeah. Father, he's Son, Holy Spirit. No, no, together, no. So. I'm going to explain what he's saying. If death, because he's been brainwashed into thinking, if you die, you cease to exist. That's what yes. Joseph Winston thinks. Yes. Uh, you cease to exist. So how can Jesus be God if he died? Cause he means he ceased to exist and God can't cease to exist. Exactly. Who said death means you cease to exist. That's a lie. Let me prove to you that when Jesus died, he was still alive in conscience from their Bible. Are you ready? Yes. John 2, 19 and 22. So you understand John the two. question? Yeah, John 2, 19 and 22. Let me repeat the question. Okay. Joe's witnesses think death means you cease to exist. So if Jesus died, he ceased to exist. But God cannot cease to exist. How can he be God? Because you've been brainwashed and deceived into thinking death means secession of life. 
I'm not going to prove to you Jesus died, but he was still alive and conscious. John 2, 19 to 22. It says, Jesus replied to them, tear down this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. So who's going to raise up the body? His own body, Jesus. I will raise it up, right? Yeah. Keep reading. The Jews then said, this temple was built in 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? You will raise it up in three days? Mm -hmm. Who will do it? Jesus. Okay, keep going. But he was talking about the temple of his body. When, though, he was raised up from the dead, his disciples recalled that he used to say this, and they believed the scripture and what Jesus had spoken. So I would say, Dad, who told you Jesus ceased to exist? Because he's the ever-living God. When he physically died and his body was in the tomb, he was still alive and conscious, sustaining his body and bringing it back to life. Mm -hmm. So where's the problem? Amen, yeah. That's how you refute it. Now he's going to say, oh, well, it doesn't mean that. I go, no, Dad, it means that. It says that he will raise it up. No, but mm -hmm. Jehovah raised it. Yeah, Father raised Jesus up. Jesus raised himself up, and the Holy Spirit raised Jesus because they did it together. But yeah. Jesus also raised himself up with the Father and the Spirit because Jesus didn't cease to exist. So as God, he's ever living. Though as a man, his body died because that takes place when your spirit leaves your body, which he doesn't believe. But James 2.26 in his Bible says he's wrong. James 2.26. Let me read it. Uh, James. They don't believe that, Joe. So they don't believe there is a Hades where there's a netherworld. Joe's witnesses believe when you die, you cease to exist. You're remembering Jehovah's mind and that there is no everlasting hell, everlasting conscious torment. They don't believe any of that. I'll explain so, to you what they believe about hell in a minute. But go to James 2.26. Why does a person physically die? It says, indeed, just as the body without spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. That's why he was his body died because his spirit that animated his body left. Okay, yeah. But they don't believe their spirit. There's a spirit of you that's separate from your body. You are your spirit, and they your spirit is you. That. But that's wrong. So so just, just so I'm 100% clear on it, when Jesus when Jesus died, his body died, obviously. he His spirit went back to heaven, and then... Well, no, that's a more common. Don't confuse yourself. Why do you want to get into that conversation when your dad doesn't believe any of that? No, no he no, didn't just, go just, to just heaven. So just so I could know. No, he went to what they call the underworld, Hades where the souls of the dead were all there. Some were in peace and rest. Abraham's with some others were in torment. That's where he went. And then Abraham and the saints who were there in peace and rest, awaiting Jesus to take their spirits into heaven. So he went mm -hmm. there and took them out and brought them into the Father's heavenly presence. That's why now, after Christ, if you die in union with Christ, you enter heavenly paradise. Oh, okay. All yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Just, I just wanted to know. For, yeah, for, for you. Yeah, that's good. I just did a series. Just I, right now, man, I just did a session. If you keep following this, I did Death in the Afterlife. Go to my live stream again, YouTube. Click on live. Go to my YouTube channel. Click on live. You're going to see one of the sessions called Death and the Afterlife. I yes, think that's it. Thing. I went in depth on this. It's right there. But for your sake. All you need to show your dad is Jesus was still consciously alive, which is why he could raise himself back to life. All right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So where's the problem with Jesus being God, dying a human death without ceasing to exist? There is no problem. Mm -hmm. So you got it? Yes, I do. Now, for the rest of you, let me tell you what hell is for a Jehovah Witness, because I was meeting with an elder who told me. Hell means non-existence. Okay, Joe and everyone else? Hell, they'll tell you, is not a place of fire or punishment. Hell means non-existence where you're wiped out of existence and you'll never be resurrected or recreated. That's hell, according to Jehovah's Witness. Because when you die, if you're not part of the 144,000, now you guys don't want you to listen to this. This is what they believe. Since 1914, where Jesus began reigning invisibly over the world, if you're one of the 144,000, when you die, your spirit goes to be heaven. Because then you'll be born again. You'll reign with Christ in heaven as a spirit creature. But if you're not part of the 144,000, when you die, you cease to exist. But if you've been pleasing to Jehovah, he will then recreate, resurrect you during the millennial reign after Armageddon. They also believe that people who were never properly taught the gospel and died, Jehovah will resurrect them or recreate them during the millennial reign to be taught about Jehovah, and then if they accept, they will live forever. If not, then he'll wipe them out. 
Yeah, you you got it perfectly. Yep. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you confirming that I understood this cult correctly. I love yeah, you, you mister. No, I'm just saying thank you. Because people think I'm a false teacher, like your dad thinks I'm a false teacher. But you don't think I'm a false teacher, do you? No, no. Okay, because if you did, I'd block you right now. No, I'm just kidding. Play with <laughs> you. Anyway, so you guys see this, what they believe. All right, now, hell for them is those individuals who died who will never be resurrected. And I said recreated because they're wiped out. So he has to recreate them. So it's not even a resurrection. And already they'll tell you there are three right now in hell, meaning they'll never be resurrected. Adam, Eve, and Judas. That's what they teach. You guys know that? They believe Adam and Eve was not forgiven. And their punishment is when they died, they'll never be resurrected. And Judas, he died, never be resurrected because that's hell. You'll never be resurrected. Mm -hmm. So Adam, Eve, and Judas are in hell, according to them. So there you go. Yep. So I'm just explaining that because they're wondering what they believe. So now you got the answer, right? Jesus is yes. still alive. And as God, he's the one who raised his body with the Father. So make sure you're telling him, I'm not saying Jesus did it alone. As a Trinitarian, Father, Son, Holy Spirit did it together. Mm -hmm. All right. So that was the other question. So now that was question what? Number three? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. All right. Well, go ahead. Um, so this one, I'm pretty sure is on another easy one, but when Jesus says that him and the father are one, my dad does not necessarily believe that that's one in essence because oh, the that's scriptures so also to say that the believers are one. Say dad, don't go to John 17, 11 or 21 to 22 for me. That's what he did. Right. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. See, I knew it. Right. It's like, man, Sam, what are you a prophet? Did you see the past? <laughs> no, because you know, I, you made a mistake. You read John 10, 30, and you stopped there. Why did you stop there? Why did you quote I and the Father one? Because maybe you haven't found my channel, and I've always told people that's not how you prove your case. You don't quote John 10, 30, I and the Father one, because your dad did what I've told people here your dad would do. Your dad did what I tell people they'll do. They'll go to John 17, 11. The disciples are one. As Jesus is one with the Father, because you did what a lot of Christians do. You just quoted John 10 30. So without opening up John, don't open up John 10. If I ask you, what's the context of that statement? Because verse 30 means there are 29 verses before it, right? Yes. So why did he say I and the Father are one? Don't look it, look it up. Just tell me from your memory. Um, I I mean, I know that he's talking about the like sheep and how it belongs to the Father. So, like, I guess he was saying that, like, he has the same power as the Father. How do you know if you don't know the context? You're just guessing. Oh, uh, no, yeah, yeah. I, I I don't know the entire context. That's right. So you made a mistake, and you're going to learn from your mistake. Yes, sir. Anyone who just quotes John 1030, they're doing a disservice because John 1030 is not where you start to prove your point that Jesus is claiming to be God. Now, let me show you how to use John 1030. You ready? Are you ready? Yeah, yeah. Go yeah, to John 10. Open up John 10, their Bible. All right. Yeah. That's one of my pet peeves, as you can tell. When I see people quoting a verse but not giving the context, there you go. You just set yourself up for destruction. Why? I learned the hard way. The reason why I know what to do, what not to do, I made these mistakes. Early on in the 90s, there was a Joe Witness who was Chaldean, meaning a Syrian, because the Syrian Chaldean the same people. He tore me to shreds because I had just come to the faith, and I made the, these mistakes. So my my promise to the Lord was, God, if you're pleased to use me and preserve me for your glory, I will teach my brothers and sisters of Christ, your church, what to do, what not to do by the power of the Holy Spirit working through me to learn from my mistakes so they don't commit them. So I made the same mistakes, not because I'm smarter or better than you. I've been doing it longer than you. So this is mm -hmm. why always learn from those who are before you to avoid their mistakes so you can get to where we got faster than we did by the power of the Holy Spirit, yes. right? Yes. So now let me show you how you're going to silence your dad. You're going to now rock him. If you now understand, that's why you go back, rewatch until by the Holy Spirit, it becomes second nature and you're comfortable because now you know how to share. Don't share if you haven't understood it. Wait till you understand it, then share it. And then you're going to rock his world. I promise you, he's going to be rocked by the power of the Holy Spirit. And hopefully he'll come and worship the Trinity with you. But you don't start at 30. You're going to start at 27. John 10, 27, 28. Okay, it says, my sheep listen to my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them everlasting life and they will by no means ever be destroyed and no one will snatch, snatch them out of my hand. So here's what you're going to highlight. 
He says, my sheep, my voice, right? Mm -hmm. My hand. Okay. Right? So the believers are Jesus' sheep, and they're in whose hand? Jesus' sheep. Uh, so, Jesus hand, okay, now hand is a metaphor. He's not talking about hand because that would be one huge hand. Hand means power because when you think hand, yeah, yeah. you think power, you think strength, you think resistance. Mm -hmm. They're in my hand, meaning under my care, under my protection, right? Yes. So believers are Jesus' sheep, hear Jesus' voice in his hand, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now go to Psalm 95, 6 to 8 in their Bible. Psalm 95, verses 6 to 8. It says, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before Jehovah, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the sheep in his care. No, no, it says in care, but in the Hebrew, you're going to know it. It's not in his care, the sheep in his hand. Mm, you see okay. their Bible, they have a note there. They're going to tell yeah, you. Yeah, it says of his hand. Okay, so wait, the Israelites are the sheep of who? Uh, God, Jehovah. But of what part of Jehovah? His hand. So reread it with that reading. Reread it For again. He is our God, and we're the people of his pasture, the sheep in his hand. So believers are the sheep in Jehovah's hand, right? Yes. Then look, well, look what it says. Um, Finish it. Today, if you listen to his voice. Okay, you confuse me. The sheep are Jehovah's sheep in Jehovah's hand, and they're to hear his voice. But Jesus said, mm -hmm. they're my sheep in my hand, and they hear my voice. Mm, yeah. Okay, hold on. So help me understand. Jehovah, here we're told, believers are Jehovah's sheep in Jehovah's hand under his care, and they hear his voice. Jesus says, they're my sheep in my hand, and they hear my voice. Mm -hmm. Okay, now a second thing. Jesus said, and I give them everlasting life, right? Yes. And no one can deliver them out of my hand? Mm -hmm. Now go to Deuteronomy 32, 39. Deuteronomy 32, 39. John Irish, I don't have one article. I have almost more than 12 articles on John 10, and I have at least 12 sessions on John 10. Search YouTube channel. Search John 10, Jesus, Sheep, Jesus, Jehovah, and go to my blog. It's there, brethren. I'm tired of repeating myself. It's there, brethren. So now, remember what Jesus said? I give them everlasting life, yes. and none can deliver out of my hand, right? Yes. Deuteronomy 32, 39. It says, see now that I, I am he, and there are no, there are no gods apart from me. I put to death and I make alive. I wound and I will heal and no one can rescue from my hand. So Jehovah says, I'm the only God who controls life and death. So I make alive and none can rescue out of my hand, right? Yes. But Jesus says, I give them everlasting life and no one can deliver them out of my hand. Wow. You caught it, right? Yep. You see why you did a disservice by starting at 30? Yes, sir. But now go to Isaiah 43, 13. Isaiah 43? Isaiah 43, verse 13. It says, Also, I am always the same one, and no one can snatch anything out of my hand. When I act, who can prevent it? So once more, again, Jehovah says, No one can snatch anything out of my hand? Yep. And I'm the one who makes alive. There's no other God who can do this. Mm -hmm. And she, the, the believers are Jehovah's sheep and Jehovah's hand hear his voice. Yes. But in John 10, 27, 28, Jesus says, they're my sheep. They hear my voice. They're in my hand. I give all of them everlasting life and no one can deliver out of my hand. Who does Jesus think he is? Wow. Yeah. You caught it now? Yes. But now let's read 29 and 30. John 10, 29 and 30. See, now we know what he means by I and the Father are one. Uh, that's in John 10, yeah. Yep, you read 27, 28. Now look what he says about the Father in 29 to 30. It says, what my Father has given me is something greater than all other things. And what he gave was the authority to raise up and glorify the sheep. So go ahead. And no one can snatch them out of the hand of the Father. Hold on, brother. Uh, uh, Joseph and Mark and Omar. I can't help it if you guys do not listen carefully or take the moment to rewind because even Mark D'Azusa didn't hear it. It wasn't Psalm 95, 7. It was Psalm 95, 6 and 7. Psalm 95, 6 to 8. And I've done this session 10 million times. This is why, Joseph, this is a ground for the church to dissolve your marriage and set your wife free. 
because you've been here for a while. You've been listening to these sessions and you still don't remember these passages. Guys, let me know if I'm wasting my time teaching you guys. Because when I see regulars that hear me talk about a same subject that I know they've heard me discuss and they still don't know where the verses are, you are really destroying my confidence in teaching you guys. I have to repeat that it's Deuteronomy 32, 39 and Isaiah 43, 13. Let me know if I'm wasting my time. How many times will you have to hear the same thing until you finally get it? Because if you're not getting it, then you're a waste. You're useless because that means you're not going to be able to use it in evangelism. So then why are you here? All right, brother. Go to John 10, 29 to 30. Um, so 29 to 30? Yeah. For my Father has given me something greater than all other things, and no one can snatch them out of the hand of the Father. I and the Father are one. So reread 29. What my Father has given me is something greater than all other things, and no one can snatch them out of the hand and of then, the Father. And 28, Jesus said, no one can snatch him out of my hand? Yes. And no one can snatch him out of my Father's hand? Yes. And this is where John 10, 30 comes in. Why? Because I and the Father are one. Now, if hand means power, no mm -hmm. one can deliver them out of my Father's power to protect them, and no one can deliver them out of my power to protect and preserve them. So what does he mean we are one? That they're one of the same essence? One more time, brother, before I have to block you for disappointing me, breaking my heart. If hand means power... No one can deliver them from my father's hand out of my father's power to preserve them. And no one can deliver out of my hand, my power to preserve them. What does he mean that we're one? One in what sense? That they have the same power. Yeah. They are one in power. That's how you know it's one in essence. Because the power that they possess in common is the power of God. And that's almighty power which only God has. So then by extension, you can say, yeah, it's one in essence. Because if Jesus's power is the Father's power and their Father, their power is equal, well, that's the power of God. And only God has that power because only God is almighty. So the Father and the Son must be the almighty God and therefore one in nature. Um, what, if, what if he says that, you know, the if, Father gave the Son authority to do that? So if I give you authority to raise the dead, can you raise the dead? Oh, yeah, true, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, no, no, answer me. I'm going to say, hey, I give you authority. Go command the dead to come out of the tombs right now. What's going to happen? If you give me authority, I'm going to do it. No, you can't because if you don't have the power, I can author authorize you to do it all day on the line. You're going to be there like a dumbass embarrassing yourself. So you still don't get it. If you tell your six-year-old da daughter, I give you authority to drive my car. She gonna be able to drive the car? No, she can't. No, no. But according to you, you just said if she, I give her authority. I mean, she can't. So you're not understanding. No, no, I get it. No, I get it. No, right. I get it. So I can give you authority all day, all night to do something, but if you don't have the ability to do what I authorize you to do, then it's waste of time for me to give you that authority. Yeah. You understand now? Yeah, yeah, I get it. He ha he has to have the power to do that already. To and or he, say it again. To be able to even do it, if someone gives you the authority to do it, he has to have that power to do so. Bam! Now I want to kiss your head. You restored my hope in humanity. So you're not a brain gas. Joseph is a brain gas, not you. He's Balaam's ass. <laughs> you want me there? Yes, sir. To authorize someone to do something assumes that you know that person has the ability to do what you allow him to do. Yes, yes. You understand? Yes, I understand. That's why he says, what my father has given me is greater than all. What did my father give you? The father gave me the authority, the right to raise believers and glorify them. But for Jesus to be authorized by the father to do that, he has to have the power of God to do that because only God can do that. Right? Mm -hmm. And, and if, it was, if he was just a creature and the Father gave him the power to do that, then... Yeah. Then now, if, he's, if it says he gave him power, now we have a problem because now God is elevating a creature to the status yeah. of Jehovah. Yeah, yeah. Because what did the Old Testament say? Jehovah is the only God that gives life, right? And none can deliver out of his hand. So for then to say the Father then gave Jesus the power to do what only Jehovah does... That means Jesus is being elevated to the status Jehovah. Why, if he's a creature, 
that's idolatry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Are you with me there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. 100%. So don't confuse authority with ability. I can give you authority, but I don't give you the ability to act upon what I authorize you to do. That's why I have to give you an example of my daughter. I have a six-year-old, let's say. She's not six. My 12-year-old. I say, I give you authority to drive my car. If I give her the key, she's going to smash into something, God forbid, hurt herself or someone else. Yeah. I can only authorize someone to do something if I know that person has the ability to do the thing that I'm allowing him to do. Yes, yes. And so Jesus now is taking the language of the Old Testament about Jehovah and ascribing it to himself. Why? If he's not Jehovah. Because you don't find a creature like Gabriel or Moses saying, I make alive and none can deliver out of my hand. And there are my sheep in my hand and they hear my voice. That's only said of Jehovah, right? You just read it. Mm -hmm, yeah. I make alive, none can snatch out of my hand. And from that, from the day I make alive, right? None can deliver out of my hand, snatch out of my hand. When I decide to act, who can then stop me? And they are my sheep in my hand, hear my voice. This is said of Jehovah. In Psalm 95, 68 says that we are his sheep, right? We are the people of his pasture, the sheep in his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not rebel. Jesus says, they're my sheep in my hand to hear my voice. But wait, that sounds like Jehovah, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I give them everlasting life. But wait, Jehovah says he's the only God that makes alive. And according to the society, you're a God, but you're not the true God. So how can you, a God, do what only Jehovah does? Because he's the only God that gives life. Yep. I understand, yeah. Edwin, you just answered the question. If you're that stupid, you're stupider than Muhammad, then you're a dumb bastard because you just answered the question. It wasn't the apostles who raised the dead. Jesus did it from heaven when they invoked him to do it. Now get the hell out of here. You dumb son of the devil thinking that that's an objection. The idiot answers his own question. How did uh, the apostles raise the dead in Jesus' name? Oh, gee, because they did in Jesus' name, meaning they invoked Jesus by his authority to do it for them. You mm -hmm. son of the devil, you Bible pervert, mm -hmm. idiot. Here, in fact, here, speaking of which, go to Acts 9, 33 to 35. Read that for me, sir. Another miracle of Jesus that I didn't show you. Acts 9. The idiot, I mean, the guy's so stupid, he makes stupid people look intelligent. He answered his own question. Well, how did the apostles raise the dead in Jesus' name? Oh, gee, is it because you just said it in Jesus' name? Meaning they invoked Jesus and Jesus did it from heaven, like he said in John 14, 12 to 14? I mean, there's people who make stupid people look intelligent. It's a special kind of stupid. It makes me and Protestant look like we're intelligent, even though me and Protestant are a bunch of idiotai. Acts 9, 33, 35. It says, there he found a man named, I don't know how to pronounce that. Well, name your ne next son after that man. Go ahead. Who had been lying flat on his bed for eight years, but he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Why are you Ryan laughing, sir? Huh? Why'd you laugh, sir? Because I don't know how to say his name. Who cares, man? Just say, hey, Tony. Tony, add a name, right, man. Yeah. Peter said to him, Tony, Jesus Christ heals you. Now, you Ryan see how that answered this bed. idiot, Eddie Edwin J., who makes me and Protestant look intelligent? Because Edwin James is a special kind of stupid. Who healed them? Jesus Christ. That's how they did it, you moron. You're a special kind of stupid. That's why your mother decided not to have children after you. <laughs> okay? Because Jesus was doing it, not them. In the name of Jesus. So Jesus from heaven did the miracle. Jesus Christ heals you. And then when he said Jesus Christ heals you, did he get healed? Yes. Well, read it again. It says... Jesus Christ heals you. Rise up, rise and make up your bed. And he got up immediately. Yeah. By the way, you need to repent because you butchered the Bible like the Jehovah's Witnesses did. You added words there. It wasn't Tony, mister. Hey, you told me to. <laughs> oh, so if I tell you to commit suicide or throw yourself off a building, you're going to do it too? That's a good point. All right, anyway. Now, but you got it, right? Jesus did it, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, how did the apostles raise the dead in Jesus' name? Oh, you just answered, idiot. Oh, in Jesus' name. Oh, gee, baby, baby, baby. You shouldn't be a moron. You should be more off. And you wonder why I lose my testimony with Joseph and other people. Anyway, now you got it, right? Yeah. Now you know how to show from John 10, 30. Do you know how to show from John 10, 30 that I and the Father one means one in power? 
But the mm -hmm. power that they possess in common is the power of God because it requires the infinite power of God to raise the dead and make them immortal where they never die. Mm -hmm. So that means Jesus saying, I'm the Father, our Almighty. Yes. You see it? Mm -hmm. Jesus does what only Jehovah does, and the Father does what only Jehovah does because together they're the one God, Jehovah, because the Father's power is the Son's power, but the power they possess is the power of Jehovah, and that's almighty power. Mm -hmm. That's if you read in context, right? Yeah. Which reminded me of what I wanted to show you earlier before we move on to your fifth question, because that answered your fourth one, right, John 1030? Yes, sir. Okay. I forgot to show you in John 14 another example of the dishonesty of the society because they go with a Greek text online that's called the Westcott Hort text. This is the collated Greek text that they use. But when that Greek text says things that goes against their doctrine, they don't translate a portion of the Greek and they'll mm -hmm. follow another manuscript that agrees with them. What do I mean? I want you to go back and read John 14, 13 and 14. It says, also, whatever you ask in my name, I will do this. Okay, so uh, whatever you ask in my name, I will do this, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now read. Keep reading all the way to 14. So, so that the Father may be glorified in connection with the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Okay, did you now catch it? If you ask anything in my name, I will do it, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Guys, here is their Greek interlinear. They use the Westcott Hort collated Greek text. Here it is online. They make it available online for free. I want everyone to click on it. The Greek text that they use says, if anyone asks me in my name, I will do it. They didn't include the word me. They omitted it so that you don't pray to Jesus directly. Mm -hmm. Now, were you aware of this before this? Uh, yes, yes. Good. Uh, this is one of the things that I saw in the Greek. Amen. So, guys, I gave you the link. That's the link to their interlinear. Right there, please click on it. JW.org. If you go to the Bible down, they have online Bible, their Greek text that they made available. I just gave you a look. Link to John 14, 14. You don't even need to read Greek. It'll show you. It says, if e ever anything you should ask me. It's right there. If ever anything you should ask me, in the name of me, this I shall do. So the word me is there. Even in the Greek, it looks like the English word me. So yeah. this is their Greek text that they use. But because this goes against what they teach, you don't speak to Jesus and ask him. You ask in his name. They did include the word me. You, when anything you ask me, they omitted it. They didn't want to do that. They didn't go with this Greek text. Yeah. You guys see it? So I just wanted to make that point because I don't want to ever forget. So now what was your fifth question? So um, I think I'm running out of time. Um, oh, it's okay. I have to go do something. All right, then day. if you want to do, we can do tomorrow part three if you want to stop here because you already got uh, two hours and 20 minutes. And this, I don't want to give you information overload. So we can do part three tomorrow, God willing. Yeah, God willing. Yeah, I okay. have uh, one more question about Jesus, and then I would want to get into the Holy Spirit. Oh, yes. So is your questions five, six, seven all about Jesus, or it's about the Holy Spirit, six, seven? Um, so, yeah, actually, it was just six questions, not seven. I, I, I counted wrong. But okay. the next one was about Jesus, and then the one after that was basically just if you can help me yes, find Holy scriptures about the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that will do part three. Tomorrow, God willing, we'll do just a session on the Holy Spirit. So what is your final questions about Jesus? The final one was basically, um, so he always like my dad likes to bring up the firstborn of all creation, oh, beginning of creation. I don't know how to how to explain that. That's, That's just too Jesus easy. being the head of creation. Too easy. Say number one, firstborn does not mean first created. It can mean the one who has the highest position, the highest status, and who's the heir. Mm. That's number one. So the question is in Colossians 1:15, Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. So doesn't that mean he's the first one created? No. Now, let me explain. Now, make sure later you go to my, here, let me get you the article now. Why am I even waiting? But I'll answer right now. Okay. Now, let me break this down for you. You got to rewatch these sessions until by the Holy Spirit, you understand them. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to understand, right? I will. I will. Okay. I just wrote an article on it on firstborn. Let me get it for you. Okay. Genitive, right? Oh, boy. Let me find it, man. Too many. Let me find it for you, buddy. Hold on. Genitive. Okay. okay. 
Support Nation. Yeah, hold on. And then I'm going to answer for you right now. And I did a session on this. So find it. Do like Firstborn and the search engine. But let me get you the article. Is this it? Yeah. Okay, here it goes. Genitive of subordination. Here it is. Here's the article on Colossians 1.15. Here it is, guys. One of many articles. Here you go. On Firstborn of all creation. There it is for you guys right there. Use the search engine. You're going to find all of these. Now, Joseph, did you go silent? Did I hurt your feelings? Where's your wife so she can just... Lay hands on you and bless you, Joseph. I'm sorry, Sam. You hurt my feelings. <laughs> come on. Gird up your loins. You're supposed to be a Syrian, you little sissy. But anyway, coming back to you. You ready? Yeah. You got the link to the article? Yeah. All right. Firstborn of all creation. Okay. Firstborn has three meanings. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. The one born first, who is the heir, because if you're the one born first, you're the heir. The inheritance is yours, right? Mm -hmm. And holds the highest position and status. So. In reference to Jesus, is he the firstborn because he's the one for, the one created first? Or no. is he the firstborn because he is the heir and the one who has the highest position, the supreme position over all creation because he owns it? Let's see. Now, let me first prove to you that the term firstborn doesn't always mean the one born first. Are you ready? Yeah. Go to Psalm 89. How did the apostles uh, raise people in Jesus' name? What an idiot, dude. You're a disgrace to humanity. That's why you're the only child. You you destroyed your mother's hope in having other children. So I have no respect for these cultists. And you're laughing in your heart, aren't you? Psalm 89. Yeah, read Psalm 89, 19 to 20. At that time, we spoke in a vision to your loyal ones and said, I have granted strength to a mighty one. I have exhausted a chosen from among the people. I have found David, my servant. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. So who... Is he speaking about? Uh, David. Okay, so David, right? Yeah. Okay, now read 26, 27. Look what he says about David. He will call out to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And I will place him as firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Okay, did you catch it? David mm -hmm. will be my firstborn, but David wasn't the first son of Jesse. He was the youngest of Jesse's eight sons. In 1 Samuel 16, it says David was the youngest of eight sons. So he wasn't the first one born, right? No, yeah. And he wasn't the first king. Saul was the king before him, right? Wait, sorry, you broke up again. What, uh, I don't break up with you because I don't date men, dude. Stop saying I <laughs> broke up with you. All right. Was David the first king? Uh, no, no. Saul was king before him, right? Mm -hmm. So what does it mean that he's the firstborn if he's not the one born first? He's the youngest of eight sons. Jesse had eight sons. David was the youngest. That's 1 Samuel 16. He's the youngest of eight sons. He's not the one born first, and he's not the first king. So why is he called the firstborn? Because, well, I guess in, in this one, God exalted him. That's it? God exalts many people. Um, it's right I in front of it, your eyes. It's right there. Oh, sorry. The highest, the highest of the kings of the earth. So what does it mean to be firstborn? That uh, in this context, it means that he's the highest of the kings of the earth. That so he's like the highest rank. Status, right? So yeah. firstborn can mean status. Firstborn means the one who's supreme, preeminent, superior to everyone else. Mm -hmm. Not the one born first, right? Yeah, no, no. Because he can't be. He's not the first king and he's the youngest of eight sons. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. If you don't get it, you're not going to be able to see it and you can't help your dad see it. You got it? Yeah, I got it. I got it. Okay, now another example where firstborn refers to someone's status, not the one born first. Go to First Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. First Chronicles 5. Verses 1 to 2. Here's another example of firstborn referring to someone's status, not that he's the first one born. First Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. It says, these are the sons of Reuben, Israel's firstborn. So now, before you move on, Reuben was the son born first. Yes. So here, firstborn means the one born first. Okay. But keep reading. Oh, he hung up. Go to room. Why'd you hang up, you little sinner? No, he's not picking up. How's that going to work? What happened, dude? What a bummer. Now you're not going to pick up that I'm calling you? 
All right. Well, I can't finish it if he doesn't call. Before the rapture, dude. Oh, now he's not unavailable. All right. He's gone, guys. All right. Let me see if he's going to call back. He had to go, but what a way to end it. We didn't even get his answer. I hope I can find him, lay hands on him, and bless him. All right. Did Joseph leave? Joseph, are you still hurt? Sorry, Sam. I'm work all day, and I can't watch you, man. But so I don't go back and watch the other session I can learn. I don't know what happened. And Brethren says he's offline. So he probably lost his internet connection. Now, for the rest of you, look at this dude. It's going in and out. Well, that doesn't matter. If it's ringing, why aren't you picking up? And if you're texting, why aren't you working? Let's see. Let's see if he's going to call me. It says, not letting him let me pick up. Let's see. Satan always wants to attack and distract us. Man, dude. Let's see now. I got to open this up. It's already open. Hold on, brethren. Let me see if I can finish at least this point. If not, I'm going to have to leave you in suspense. Oh, D, Joseph, I'm here, Sam. I was just hiding, crying, and let my wife. But thank you, Sam, because she saw me crying. Now she's hugging me and giving me love and affection. Thank you, Sam. Oh, did that bald Jilu hurt you, Joseph? Joey? Yeah, he did. Here, come here, baby. At least you got a wife whose arms you can run into and hug you. Oh, sorry. I just hung up on a bike snag. See, by mistake. See? See what you did, Joseph? At least you got a wife to hug you. What do I got? I got a pillow. What happened, dude? I think my internet went out. I have no idea what happened. That Satan's attacking because Satan's getting angry, dude. Are you praying against warfare? Yes, I am. All right, sir. You better get off that horse. <laughs> now, First Chronicles 5, verse 1 and 2. You there again? Yes, yes, I am. All right, so let's end it with this argument. In Jesus' name, we finish it. Then you can be free to go and play Xbox, whatever you play. But go to First <laughs> Chronicles 5. Let's read verses 1 and 2. It says, these are, these are the sons of Reuben, Israel's firstborn. Now, was Reuben the was the one born first, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, watch what happens, though. He was the firstborn, but because he defiled the bed of his father, his right as firstborn was given to the sons of Joseph. Ah, right there. Notice, he was born first, but the status of firstborn was given to Joseph. That's mm -hmm. what's given to his sons. But Joseph was son number 11. So right there, you're mm -hmm. told Joseph was the firstborn, but he's son number 11. How was Joseph the firstborn? In status, because if you're the firstborn, you're higher than your brothers, supreme over them in the air. And if you read Genesis, whom did God exalt over the sons of Jacob? Joseph, right? Mm -hmm. So Joseph is firstborn in what sense? Of rank. Rank. He's, he's higher than his brothers. That's why they bowed to him. God exalted him. And he's number 11, even though Reuben was born first. And David is firstborn in what sense? Uh, the, uh, he was the highest of the kings of the earth. So in what sense is he the firstborn? That he, he is higher in rank. Rank, right? Yeah. And Joseph is also firstborn because he was given the inheritance. So now you just prove two individuals who are not born first, and David wasn't the first king, but they are firstborn in terms of status. They are supreme over the rest, higher in authority, greater than the rest, in the case of Joseph, he's the heir. So firstborn can refer to one who's the heir, who owns something, and who is higher than everything else. Mm -hmm. So now what sense is Jesus firstborn? He's the firstborn in terms of being superior, preeminent, <clears throat> greater than all of creation, because he created it and he owns it. It's his inheritance. And that's what Colossians 1 goes on to say. But yeah. because the Joseph's witnesses knew this passage proved that Christ is not a creature. They added the word other four times to change the meaning. So go to Colossians 1, 15 to 18. Now watch what they did. 
They added the word other four times because they knew if they didn't add the word other, you would see that by firstborn, it cannot mean Jesus was the one first created. It says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, because by means of him, all other things were created. All other things? Heavens. Yeah. The word other is not in the Greek, and I'm going to show you from their own intern linear. It, it literally yes. says, by means of him, all things. But mm -hmm. read it the way they read it. Okay, read 16 again. Because by means of him, all other things were created in the heavens and on the earth, the things visible and the things invisible, whether they are thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, all other things have been created through him and for him. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That was disgusting. No wonder you're not <laughs> married. My bad, my bad. No, it's my bad. You just burped in my face and I felt it. But go ahead. Also, he is before all other things. And by means of him, all other things were made to exist. Now, count how many times they added the word other. How many times they added the word other? Uh, two, uh, three, four. Four times they added the word other? Mm -hmm. Now read 18. And he is the head of the body, the congregation. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might become the one who is first in all things. So right there, they didn't add the word all other things, did they? No. So why is he the firstborn? Because he is first. He is supreme. He is superior. Preeminent greater over everything. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. now here's their interlinear. What I want you to do, you don't need to read the Greek. Guys, they inserted the word other, so they have Jesus creating all other things, not creating everything. But mm -hmm. I just gave you a link to their Greek interlinear. Click on it. And, brother, I want you to read from their interlinear. Read the English words at the top of the Greek to see how they're so dishonest, satanic, that they added the word other to deceive people from the truth of what Paul was saying here. There it is it now. Says, read, read it for me. It says, because in him it was created the all things Wait, in the heavens. Wait, slowly. You're too fast, buddy. Sorry. Because in him it was created the all things in the heavens and upon Where's the, the word other? It's not there. So you mean their Greek says in him was created the all things? Mm -hmm. Is that what it said? Yes, sir. So there's no word other? Nope. Okay, now finish it. The things visible and the things invisible, whether thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, the all things through him and into him has been created. The all things were created through him and into him? Mm -hmm. So now if I translate it the way the Greek has it, God used Jesus to create all things in heaven and earth, visible, invisible. Whether thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Well, if Jesus was there before all creation, before the heavens and the earth and everything in them was created, that means he's uncreated, right? Yep. And now notice why he's firstborn, because God used him to create the whole creation for himself as his possession. Mm -hmm. Now notice verse 17, what it says, and they're interlinear. And he is before all things. So wait, is he before all things or he exists before everything, before all things? He exists before everything. Now read 17 again, slowly and loudly so they can see it. And he is before all things mm. and the all things in him, it has stood together. Now watch what their Greek admits. Jesus was there before all things existed and he made all things and he's the one who sustains and pervert, preserves all things. Mm -hmm. So if Jesus created all things, and that's the heavens and earth, everything in them, and they were created for his possession, and he sustains all things, all creation, that means he is there before creation. He brought creation to being, and he owns it. So how can he be the first one created? It's, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Nope. doesn't make any sense. So then what does it mean that he's firstborn? That means that he's just, he has the highest rank when it comes to creation. And what is the other meaning? Um, that he is the one that, well, in this in this regard of Jesus, that it means that he's the one that created all things. And what else? What is the meaning of firstborn? Well, I mean, it's either that he was the first thing created, but obviously that doesn't make any sense. It means that he's the one that's highest in rank. And what else? There was another meaning. Come on. I don't remember. Try to think about it. I said there were three meanings. Ah, 
it's not coming to my mind right now. You're not going to be able to help your dad if you're not paying attention, man. I told you there are three meanings to being firstborn. The one born first, so it can't mean that. So what's the second meaning? The one born first or um, the one, uh, I think it was the one that was, uh, like it means that like when you give someone authority or, or power or position. Let's try it again before I block you, dude. That gave you ah. three definitions of firstborn. One was the one born first. What was the second? I do not remember. You better remember because then you wasted my time and yours in this discussion. What does firstborn mean? I showed you Joseph and David. Yeah. So what did it mean they were firstborn? Well, for David, he was the highest of the kings of the earth. That means that he was the highest king in rank. So firstborn means preeminence, supreme, superior? Yeah. So Joseph was firstborn in what sense? Come on, buddy. You better remember. He wasn't first born in the sense of the first actual born, but he was the one that was given the, the title of first born because he was put into a higher authority. I'm about to block you. You got one more minute before I block you. Sam, I don't remember the last You better minute. remember it, buddy. We spent 10 minutes on it, buddy. See, I got to be tough with you because this is the mistakes people make. They pretend to hear and then they confuse. That's why when you had a discussion with your dad... He pulverized you because you're not able to articulate your points because you're not paying attention the way you should. Didn't you tell me your dad pulverized you? Uh, yeah, a little bit. A little bit. Huh? Now we're being proud. A little bit. If he was a little bit, you wouldn't be here asking me to help you. No, he pulverized you because you're not listening to articulate your position. So I'm being strict on you, buddy. So I gave you the definition. You forgot. So how are you going to help your dad? I just got to keep listening till I get it in my uh, brain. All right. So firstborn has three meanings, right? Everyone got it in the comments section because they were listening. Firstborn has three meanings. So the first meaning is the one born first. Does that apply to David? No. Did it apply to Joseph? No. But they were the firstborn. So what was the second meaning when we talked about David and Joseph? The, the uh, position of rank. So to be the firstborn in rank means what? That means that you're the highest in rank. And if you're the highest in rank, what does that make you over everyone else? Supreme. Supreme. So the firstborn is one who's supreme, preeminent, who's greater, has supremacy over the rest, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're the firstborn of a house, what else do you receive? Well, if you're the firstborn of a house, then that means, oh, you're the heir. Yeah. You see why I put pressure on you to scare the hell out of you? You got yeah, it. Yeah. Now I'm like, whew, I got it. Exactly. So if Jesus is not the one born first, but in Colossians 1, he's the firstborn in what sense? He's the heir of all creation. How do we know? Because Colossians 1, 16 says all things are created through him and for him. Man, yeah. I'm about to kiss your head. See, I knew I had to scare the hell out of you. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so Jesus is firstborn. Because he's the heir and what else? Because in Colossians 1, 18, 8, 1, 18, he's the firstborn from the dead because he destroyed death by the resurrection so that in all things he may be what? In all things, uh, he, will be, he will be first in all things. So he's the firstborn in two, two ways. Firstborn mm -hmm. as? As the heir of all creation. And? and firstborn, that means that he's supreme over creation. Why? Because if he created everything and he sustains everything and he owns everything, that makes him superior and infinitely greater than the creation that he made for himself because it's his inheritance. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But he can't be the first creature because Paul told you everything, heaven and earth, visible and visible, the entire creation, Jesus created it and he preserves it and he owns it. So then how can he be a creature? It's yeah, it wouldn't be consistent with the rest of the Bible. So what what is the Bible? Why are you going to the rest of the Bible, dude? Oh my god. No, I'm just saying, like what John also saying that why did you bring John? What has John got to do with Colossians? If you can't prove Colossians, again, I'm gonna block you. Let's try it again. No, because I'm just saying that because John says I not No, even forget to John, me. man. Stick with Colossians and prove your case. No, How I, is no it? I was just saying that the rest Don't of the Bible say it, buddy. with Jesus. So I'm gonna say, sir, there. 
I'm going to warn you a third time. Don't say it. Prove it from Colossians. How does Colossians prove that this position is inconsistent, that he's the first creature? Because after after saying that he's the firstborn of all creation, it tells you that he created literally every single thing through him and for him. That's and why like it's inconsistency. No. See why I got to be tough? Because you want to win your dad. And better here, I sharpen you up and rebuke you so you can listen. That's how it's in. You don't need to bring John. Colossians 1 is sufficient. How can he be the first one created when he when Paul goes on to say every created thing, everything that was created, heavens and earth, he created it. That means he exists before the whole creation. And it even says in Colossians 1.17, he is before all things. Mm -hmm. So it's inconsistent with what Paul went on to say in verses 16, 17, 18. That's all you need. You don't need John. Yeah. So you see why they added the word other four times? Yeah. And you that's what you tell your dad. Say, Dad, if this passage clearly taught Jesus' creature, why did the society add the word full other four times? Here's the interlinear. It doesn't have the word other, Dad. It says tapanta, all things, all things. He created all things. He is before all things. He preserves all things. He owns all things. He's superior to all things. Mm -hmm. So they saw... This passage was so powerful in proving Jesus is the uncreated, almighty son of God. Because you got to be almighty to create everything and give life to everything. You got to be almighty. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Can someone less than almighty create the whole creation and give it life? No. And you got to be uncreated if you are there before all things were created, right? Mm -hmm. That's why they added the word for. Uh, other four times to confuse you. All other things, all other things. All Say, why did they have to do that, Dad? Here's the Greek. The word other is not there. Isn't that proof that this is showing Jesus is not created? He's the uncreated creator, sustainer, and life giver. And he owns everything. He owns you and me. It's so clear you had to word, add the word other to confuse us. Now you got the argument? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You sure you got it? Yes, I'm going to listen good. to this over and over again. To okay, sure good. So appreciate I'm being tough with you because I'm trying to shake you up, man, because this is eternal life. People's salvation depends on us knowing our faith and representing it. So they don't walk away thinking you're believing falsehood. Yes, yes. No, I'm, I'm extremely grateful for it. Got it, bro. I love you. Now, tomorrow, part three is going to be the Holy Spirit, right? Yes, 100%. You let me know what time. So God bless you, brother. Sorry, I have to be tough with people. No, not no, no, because no. It's, it's, it's completely fine. Glory to God. Because that way... Now I like shook you to listen. Okay, Sam. Oh, Sam. Don't hurt me, Sam. I love you. If I had an older sister who's beautiful, I'd say you can have her. No, I don't want it. It's okay. But anyway, you got it, brother. All right. So tomorrow, part three on the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah, yeah. I'll text you to see uh, what time I'm available and we can set something yeah. up. Yeah. Let me know. I will be my my time tomorrow, Lord willing. I will be busy three o'clock your time to around 5 30 your time. Okay, then if anything, we can do it after that. Yeah, yeah. Let me know. I'm free after that. So let's do it because I want to now share the Holy Spirit. And then you're ready. All right. Thank Love you, so you brother. Much, God bless you. You're a blessing to us and all of us because they all learn. If you watch a comment section, they learn and they remember things they forgot. And it's becoming second nature. So you're blessing them too. And we'll be praying right. for you. God yes, knows him by yes. name. He goes by faith in the channel. Pray that God will bring his family to the true Jesus. Amen. All God right, bless you guys. Thank Take you care, so much. Bro. God bless. Lord be with you. You see why I'm strict, guys? You see why I'm strict? Now you understand why I'm so strict and why I get frustrated and tell you guys, you don't remember this? You're not paying attention? How many times must I do the same session before it sinks in and it becomes second nature by the power of the Holy Spirit when it's their archive? It's archived, brethren. If it wasn't archived, then I could. I understand why I would repeat myself. But if I do a session and it's now saved by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ on a channel that we pray will continue for many years, not that the Lord needs me, it's there. Go back, get off your lazy couch, and just do a search in the search engine on the YouTube channel and the blog. Now, guys, if you believe God has used me and is using me to glorify Christ and build a church, here's how you bless me. Do not stop praying for me. And you intercessory prayer warriors who've been gifted by the Spirit to pray for the church because the Lord will use your prayers to bless the church and bring people to faith. Commit my daughters and I to prayer. Ask the Lord will convict their mother to fear the Lord, destroy this marriage, 
walk away from this man because it's adultery. The Lord forgive her. And she becomes my sister in the Lord. Remain celibate for the glory of the Lord because no marriage of hers will be ever accepted. And that God will bring my daughters today, not tomorrow. So I don't have to wait any longer as they grow up and I lose these years. And ask the Lord to grant the three of us, even their mother, divine reckless, physical safety, security, protection, and health, that they fall in love with Jesus and give their life to the Lord. And I remain faithful. Cry out to the Lord to save me from my weakness, my lust, and my flesh, from food addiction, to walk worthy of Jesus, love Jesus, worship Jesus, obey Jesus, glorify Jesus more and more, even unto death, and never back down, never betray him, never blaspheme his name, and never fall into a scandal. That the work he began in me, he'll complete it. And if the Lord gives me this favor, if he tarries, I see my daughters grow up to be godly women. And then they bury me and I wait for them in the presence of Jesus Christ. Pray for that and pray the support financially stays steady. I don't lose support because I know time's getting hard. If God wants me to do this work, because this is what I do, full-time ministry. And I'll never charge you for my services. I will not. May God save me from ever charging you. I will give you my materials free. But ask the Lord to stir up hearts, to contribute financially, because that's how Paul did it. He didn't charge, but he trusts the Spirit to move people to contribute. The Lord doesn't need me. You don't need me. We need the Lord, and we'll always need the Lord, and may we love him more. In name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Father, have mercy. Son of God, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. Lord Jesus, wash us. Wash my daughters, their mother. Wash our loved ones in your blood, Lord Jesus. Fill us. Save us from our sin, save us from wickedness, and save my daughter's mother from this marriage. Destroy it. It's adultery. Rebuke it so she can truly love you. Save us by the Spirit to never betray, but to love you, Lord Jesus Christ. And the work you begin on us completed until you return, because we believe you died, you rose again, and you'll return physically, bodily to judge the living and the dead. And we await your coming, and we love you, Lord. Keep us in love with you, because you are life, and without you, there is no life. And we trust in you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Father, have mercy. Son of God, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. In Jesus' name, Maranatha. Lord bless you.